Athens. Hope they will uh, reconsider their rules uh, at the end of July. If it if it would be like that, I will be immediate. Yeah. yeah, the problem is they might be even stricter the rules <coughs> of July. So I will uh, reconsider their rules uh, at the end of July. If yeah, it, if it would be like that. Yeah, they would. Be they will yeah. reconsider them, yeah, but the they, problem is they might be even stricter in <coughs> July. So I will uh, reconsider their rules uh, at the end of July. Yeah, if it would be like that. Yeah, they would. They will yeah. reconsider them, yeah, but so the problem is they, they might be even stricter. I don't know if it is in your case, but for me is uh, is is in loop, is continuously uh, repeating uh, um, our conversation. Okay, just to let you know that we are live streaming and recording, so we might uh, postpone our private conversations to later. Welcome to the international online conference, reviving depopulated. Um, uh, towns and, and so we should begin and Odgil um, Kuvanci who is a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Architecture and Design of Odgil University is going to be chairing the salutation session. Um, if there is any technical problem we will no I am opening now a backstage uh, no I'm not going to open it now because if yeah, I can do that. I can, no. Okay. In case of any technical problem, there will be a backstage breakout room. You, you would be able to join that by clicking on the menu below um, breakout rooms. And there, some of our technical staff would be helping out, helping you out with solving the technical problem while the conference keeps going on. So, Osgil Osgulanchi, the floor is yours. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Osgios Kumanje. Me and my colleagues Riai Al Hussein and Anla Nenek is going to host this session. I am very happy to welcome you to the International Online Symposium, Reviving Depopulated Towns, Documentation, Preservation, Design, which is the opening conference of Second International Architecture Summer School in Aversa. I sincerely hope that you will enjoy today and the following week of collaborating and networking. Uh, during the meeting today, we ask you to keep your microphone muted unless you are speaking to the group, and this session is being recorded right now. And at this stage, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Tom Rankin for the dissertation. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Reading. Oh, oh, okay. Go ahead. You <laughs> okay. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. The American architect Tom Rankin received his master's in architecture at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design, a BA in architecture at Princeton, and a laureate in architecture at Sapienza University of Rome. He teaches at the University of the Roma La Sapienza, the Poly California Polytechnic Rome Program in Architecture, and the Iowa State Rome Program. He is founding member of ISAR, a nonprofit organization dedicated to architecture, art, and archaeology in Rome, and he is the former director of the association, Tevere Eterno Onus. The floor is yours. Thank you, Osge. Sorry to get, jump in there too, too quickly. Um, we are coordinating a lot of complicated things here in Castelvecchio Cavizio, where I'm speaking to you from uh, Via Roma, from the main street of the modern part of the town. My colleague Dan Price here behind me and various members of the, the team are uh, slowly gathering together. Um, we're getting a slow start. The, the mayor is on the road um, arriving and we're um, waiting for the rest of the team to gather. So we'll be setting up here. But aside from the logistics, I wanna thank everybody for joining us this morning from uh, four continents. It looks like we've got people from um, Egypt in the room. We've got people from um, various parts of Europe. I saw uh, Portugal in there, Lisbon, people in Turkey. So it's a great international group that is uh, descending on this small town. We've got people from Israel here as well. Um, and the town actually is far more lively than we've ever seen it before. When we arrived last night in the pouring rain. We um, we were greeted by lots of youth singing activities. 
So I'm starting to rethink the notion about revitalizing the town because there is partying going on well into the evening. Um, the Borgo itself, which is the focus of our work, was pretty quiet, exception of a few children playing there. But over the next few days, we'll be sharing with you remotely that experience and sharing with the people who are here on site um, the analysis, the research, the documentation of the site. The, the weather doesn't look great, but it's cleared right now. So for the purposes of our survey, we should be okay. Um, we're gonna be starting with the interiors of the Palazzo del Capitano. We'll be setting up there as our, um, as our logistical base. And when the rain uh, gives us a break, we'll be out doing uh, digital scanning and um, photogrammetry. And um, in a couple of days when the drone pilot arrives, we'll be continuing the drone footage that we took last year. So we have a lot in store for us. I wanna just bring my, my greetings officially on the part of the International Society for Art, Archaeology and Architecture of Rome, which is the um, host organization here, along with Osigen University and various other universities. And whoops, <laughs> we've got we to mute some of the audios because we'll have echo here. And, um, and in particular, the uh, city of Castelvecchio Calvisio. I know we have probably next on the list, Mayor Luigina Antonacci, who I keep looking over my shoulder because she should be driving up the road um, shortly and getting set up. But I think we should come back to her um, as soon as she's set up to, to join us. So we have um, greetings from the other co-organizing colleagues, um, Alessandro Camez and Giorgio Vergiani, who I haven't seen yet this morning, but um, he's nearby here. So we'll bring him in shortly. So thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you. Uh, is Professor Verdiani there? Because I'm going to be introducing him next. He is not physically here. Have you seen Giorgio? Yeah, he will go when whenever he appears. So yeah. just keep so, moving. Okay. Yeah. Then. He's sleeping upstairs, so I can go up and knock on his door. Uh, that would probably be the, the best thing to do. <laughs> but uh, let me do that and I'll, I'll come back into the room. Okay, then let's continue with uh, Professor Camis, then we will come back to him again. So uh, please let me introduce you, uh, Alessandro Camis. He graduated in architecture at Sapienza University in Rome. Before graduating, he cooperated with Sartog Architect Associated for the new Italian Embassy in Washington, DC and the Church of Jesus Holy Face in Rome. In 2007, he discussed his doctoral thesis on history of medieval town planning in Ravenna and therein attended postdoctoral studies until 2014. He is now associate professor and director of the Laboratory of Dynamic Research on Urban Morphology at the Faculty of Architecture and Design of Ozan University. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um... Uh, so welcome to our second edition of the uh, International Summer School in Castelvecchio Calvisio. It is an online, no, blended uh, summer school. So part of it is happening online. We got 30, 29 students enrolled from different countries. We forgot to mention Syria. We got a big plug from, from Syria. So how did we handle an online <coughs> blended to be more accurate <clears throat> summer school. We got inspiration from the origin of the university, the medieval uh, idea of university. This is a picture depicting a classroom in the University of Bologna, Alma Mar Mater, as early that university as 1088. You can see the classroom, the students sitting. Please notice the woman sitting there in the classroom. Uh, what not common in other schools, such as religious schools in the Middle Ages, and the teacher is sitting there. So the classroom, the students, the teacher, the cathedra, and we design a distributed virtual learning environment, which is inspired by this notion. We got a number of resources, um, 
which are depicted in this key plan in the form of a building where we got the entrance, the corridor, the main conference room, the cafe, and a number of small workshop rooms hosted on Google Meet with a Jamboard, which we, in a way, associate with the idea of the Cathedra. Each one of these rooms has a name, Canigia, Aldo Rossi, Gaspar Mange, Paolo Soleri. Benedetto Croce, each one of these um, uh, workshop rooms is dedicated to topic, architectural composition, design, survey, landscape, and has a number of tutors. But within this learning environment, we have many other um, tools such as Google Classroom, Google Drive, Miro, Pinboard, uh, sorry, Padlet, and many others, all listed together. A uh, quick overview of our tools, the Google Classroom, the Padlet, we use this as a device for sharing information. This is a self-presentation of some of our students and tutors. They could not fit all together in one page. We use Coursera as a platform uh, to, for students to take a MOOC uh, before the beginning of the summer school dedicated to recovering the human's kind past and saving the universal heritage offered by the University of Rome Sapienza. We use the Padlet for reading and commenting a book. Cesare Brandi's Theory of Restoration, it's the English translation of the Italian edition. We asked our students to quote Brandi therein using APA uh, citation style. Some of them did, some of them not yet. We generate actually, this is not the cloud, word cloud from this uh, edition, but from last edition, because none of our, not, not all of our students have finished doing the quotation stuff. We got a syllabus, which is listing here the learning outcomes, understand history, recognize principles of archeology span and conservation, develop a digital survey that will be done by the Florence team led by Giorgio Vediani, uh, recognize and apply the principles of typomorphological analysis and seismic design to the uh, design of new buildings and design new buildings, present the results in public. Each team, five teams, each team is gonna present in the midterm and final to at least to a one posters of their project, write a written report. So this is the online conference. And just to uh, quote Brodel, uh, the history of a civilization then is a search among ancient data for those still valid, valid today. On this idea, we are trying to resurrect the uh, Castelvecchio Calvisio town, which is quite depopulated currently. And just to remember and recall uh, each one of you to use the hashtag Isar School Abruzzo for your social media communication. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I think we can continue. And I would like to introduce uh, Luigina Antonacci, who is the mayor of Comune de Castelvecchio Calvisio. Do we have the connection? She does not seem to be here. I, I think Tom Rankin was about to. No, no, not, probably not. You can just, you know, move on and whatever, whenever people join, we will do that. Uh, Sorry for that, but it is quite early. Probably people are not ready yet. Okay, I think we don't also have a medical details here. Thomas Rackham is saying the mayor is here. I'll be helping her it's set up to greet you. Yeah, Tom, but when? Are you ready? Good morning. Are you listening to me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. So that's <laughs> Pastorelli. Yes, yes. Move on to Pastorelli, Ozge, and then we can go back whenever they join. Okay, Pastorelli. Okay, then. Matteo Pastorelli is the mayor of Comune di Castel del Monte, so the floor is yours. <clears throat> good morning, everyone. I'm not uh, very good to speak English, but uh, I will try. Okay. <laughs> Uh, my name uh, is uh, Matteo Pastorelli. 
and uh, I'm the mayor of uh, Castel del Monte. Uh, it is a little town in the same ter territory of uh, Castelvecchio and uh, Carapelle, a little bit uh, uh, up on the mountain. Um, <clears throat> just uh, from the name Castel del Monte, uh, that uh, uh, literally translated, uh, it means uh, the castle of the mountain. You, <laughs> you can imagine uh, uh, that it's a small town uh at 1345 meters uh, on the on the level of the sea and um, uh, we have uh, uh, 500 person living uh, living uh, there but uh, uh, just before the second world war uh, we uh, were 3000 people living here uh, the population in uh, our uh, uh, town uh, began uh, with the advent of uh, industry uh, and many of uh, our grandparents uh, moved to the big Italian cities or uh, uh, the uh, other cities of the world, uh, principal uh, to the France, Belgium, uh, United States and Canada. Uh, if I... If I uh, can I want to show you a, a picture? Um, <clears throat> but I can't. Okay. There's an option share screen under okay. the down bar. We have uh, a, a monument in our town uh, that uh, celebrates the people who moved to the world. And so we have. Uh, uh, for example, um, uh, the, the, a person uh, in uh, um, up uh, the, the representation of the world, okay, with uh, a bag in uh, in uh, in his hand. Uh, it represents the people moved to the world from this little town. Uh, so I think the the principal, uh, uh, the most important factor that. Uh, um, the most important factor, uh, the, our, the, the population is, uh, 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 yes, this is, okay, <laughs> this is the picture. The most important factor of the, our the population is uh, an entropic type of uh, factor, okay, not natural factor. And um, <clears throat> natural factor, uh, factors uh, like uh, uh, earthquake or uh, climate, uh, um, are not so important. So I think if we uh, can do the right thing, thing to, uh, in, in our little town, we can uh, come back and uh, uh, increase our, our inhabitants. Okay, but this is a matter for specialists, for professionals. And so I, uh, I am very happy uh, that uh, you uh, are in our territory to help us in a, in in a, in, um, in professional way uh, to help us to increase our habitats and come back uh, in in the time like uh, like uh, 50 years ago thank you thank you we are also very happy to be collaborating i think we can continue again and I am thanking that Luigi Antonacci, who is the mayor of Comune di Castelvecchio Calvisio, is here. The floor is yours. Yeah, great. Yeah, she is here. Luigi, are you ready to speak? I think she maybe is muted. No, she's not muted. Oh, you are not muted, but we are not able to hear you yet.
Non ti sentiamo, Luigina. Problema col microfono, non ti sentiamo. Tom, why don't you use your uh, device? She, she could speak in your uh, profile. Was it two? Sì. Okay. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Sì, sì. Yes? Yes. Okay. I give you my welcome uh, to Castelvecchio Calvicio uh, online in the conference. I am very glad for your presence and for, and, uh, for your interest uh, about uh, our village and landscape and territories. Uh, I want to present my little town. Uh, I know uh, all of you know my village, but uh, probably not all of you. <laughs> okay. Uh, encountering uh, Castelvecchio Calvisio, not far from Rome, in an idyllic, idyllic landscape surrounded my mountains, the silhouette of an ancient fortified burg set on a promontory on the slope of Gran Sasso mountains. Grows the eye, it's Castelvecchio Calvicio. You can discover a place full of character with intimate small squares and picturesque tight streets bordered by stone houses with steep external stairways. The very compact built structure of the town remembers that for centuries, close social ties have joined together the inhabitants, but there was no, no. especially during the long and uh, uh, harsh winters, the place, is impregnated with the history. Written in every stone, Castelvecchio Calvisio was a part of the field done of, of a many famous uh, no, noble families. Its population was dedicated to agriculture The small burg still keeps the atmosphere of days gone by, essentially supported by the well-preserved authenticity of its peculiar urban layout and its compact architectural structure. The almost regular elliptical shape of the fortified bark with a decumanous spine crossed by equally transversal roads makes Castelvecchio Calvisio extremely rare, if not unique. The narrow streets are bordered by stone houses of a traditional typology. And I wish you a, a good uh, travel in our towns, mm -hmm. <laughs> a virtual, a virtual uh, travel, and um, I wish good work. Great. Thank you. Thank you. you Okay, thank you. We are trying to imagine all these beautiful things, but we are not able right now. Maybe a small group uh, among us is a little bit more lucky. 
And at this stage, I would like to introduce you to Giorgio Verdiani. He is a researcher and professor at the Faculty of Architecture of Florence. He has a PhD in survey and representation of architecture and the environment. And he is specialized in digital survey using laser scanner technologies, photographic survey image, post-processing, and 3D computer graphic. The floor is yours. He's coming right now. Okay, everything. He's getting on the stage. <laughs> we have a real stage. You'll see. In the meanwhile, we can remind everyone about the <coughs> hashtag they can use for their social media communication. I'm going to post it in the uh, chat so you can eventually help us out spreading the word. The, the, the word. Also, we have created a Facebook group, which is called Distretto Culturale Terre della Baronia di Carapelle. And I think we got more than 500 people there. Um, we you know, thought of this, you know, uh, group as a virtual community moving towards the creation of a real community of the Distretto Culturale Terre della Baronia di Carapelle. Um, so the link is there, sorry, in the chat. Hold on, uh, coming up in the chat. And I wonder where Giorgio is. He's coming, he's preparing the PC. Okay, but uh, should we move on to the next one? Because we are very tight on schedule. And uh, yep, so that is the hashtag Isar School Abruzzo for social media um, communication. Giorgio, are you ready? Si sta facendo la barba. Okay, let's move on to the next one and we'll come back to Giorgio whenever he's ready, okay? Okay, do we have Domenico Di Cesare among us? Giorgio Verdiani just joined. Um, no, I don't see Domenico Di Cesare in the list of the guests. And, uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. We were waiting for you. The floor is yours. Sorry, but it seems there is a, a, an issue with the video. So, <laughs> so wrong, you are not going to see me, but I am going to share the screen in a second. So, uh, welcome everybody. I am Giorgio Verdiani. Uh, I am here coordinating the team for the survey of Castelvecchio Calvisio. This is the second survey of this place, uh, the second digital survey of this place. Uh, during the past year, we take care about the uh, main survey of all the streets in the town center, in the walled town, and we take care about the um, aerial survey, the drone survey of the uh, routes of the external fronts and so on. And uh, um, this part was a good fierce coverage of all, of all, the, uh, of all the area. So uh, what, we, uh, what we used during this work, and I go sharing the screen right now. Uh, is a set of tools that right now are well known and are obviously, uh, we may say, in a scenario of tools that allow us to document and organize ideas uh, around a digital twin, a sort of copy in a digital format of the town, of an element of an urban uh, component. And this is extremely uh, practical because 
it entered in a process across the years that started from um, the simple need of having graphical elements, moved to having a correct representation of these digital elements, and then enriching them with information. And right now, moving to use these digital twins into a management phase that allows us to control and develop uh, the whole work. So this is going to be the uh, following presentation. And during that presentation, we will see also the, uh, sorry, the results from the past year with the details about the level of coverage from which we move and so on. Right now we have a, a weather condition that all of us to enter uh, uh, the town and start uh, taking some uh, scans along the way. And then we will enter the uh, Palazzo del Capitano, the, uh, may, uh, this uh, interesting building that will be a sort of shelter in case of rain. So that's uh, all for now. Sorry, I have used a, a small part of the further presentation to uh, as a, re, um, a solution in place of the video because right now it's not starting. So you just can hear my voice and that's all for now. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. At this stage, I would like to introduce you Luis Bravo Martins from VR Air Association in Portugal. The floor is yours. Well, uh, <clears throat> first off, thank you very much for uh, for inviting me. Uh, sorry for my really, really low tone voice, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the heat wave here in Lisbon hit me hard, and uh, I I have a sore throat. Still, I will try to communicate the best way I can. Uh, I will first of all um, do a, a small share of my screen, just a minute, and you should be seeing uh, some yeah, umbrellas and now what I really want to pass on. So uh, let me give you a small introduction on uh, what the VRAR Association is uh, and then a bit about its activities here in Portugal. So. Uh, overall, we uh, at the VRAR Association, we are the largest uh, professional association uh, worldwide of uh, um, virtual reality and augmented reality um, professionals. Uh, we are, uh, as you see, uh, spread uh, across the globe uh, with um, a particular incidents in North America and Europe. Uh, our uh, three main uh, purposes are to expand uh, the, the knowledge uh, and the advancement of, uh, of virtual reality and augmented reality applications uh, in our lives. Uh, along with it, of course, uh, trying to, to promote uh, the, the use cases, the studies uh, of our member companies and uh, promote, of course, also the, the networking between them and uh, other uh, stakeholders inside the ecosystem. Um, our members are um, of various dimensions. So we're talking about big corporate members like Microsoft, like uh, Siemens, Lenovo, or small startups. Um, and alongside with that, uh, we also count with um, academic uh, partners like, for instance, Lethbridge College uh, or, um, well, several other universities that uh, are also cooperating and, and uh, working together with us on a daily basis. And so these are just uh, a bit more numbers uh, regarding what uh, uh, the activity of the VRAR Association is. Uh, here in Portugal, uh, we have been working since 2017 um, within the, the VRAR Association. Uh, we are now 106 companies uh, working towards the advancement of that and working specifically with immersive technologies and working um, in uh, uh, either uh, virtual reality or augmented reality. And of them, uh, I would say that maybe 20, 50%, I think it's 23% of them deal directly with tourism um, and applying immersive technologies uh, in, uh, in hospitality or in qualifying heritage. Um, and that, uh, of course, is uh, very important to us in the sense that uh, 
until COVID uh, was dropped on us, uh, we had 10% of our gross national product was um, being brought by, in by uh, tourism activities. <clears throat> and um, now, although it's not that heavy, and obvious, uh, the obvious reasons, the issue is that it's still one of the main um, activities that we have here in Portugal. And immersive technologies have a, a huge impact in it. Uh, so as we see virtual reality uh, by replacing um, uh, rea by replacing the physical reality by a digital one or augmented reality by overlaying digital elements on top of a physical context, what it does, both of them, but specifically augmented reality, it actually changes the meaning, adds to the meaning of spaces. And in that sense, we do believe that it uh, that immersive technologies uh, can clearly help connect people with the meaning of objects and spaces uh, that they are visiting in a way that until now it wasn't possible. So um, that's uh, why, well, again, uh, we are uh, very enthusiastic uh, about uh, the summer school and um, uh, would like to. Uh, leave you by by wishing um, well, lots of success during this road and um, or through this road. And uh, meanwhile, I'll invite you also to to visit uh, our our website. You can check the website here on the on the bottom part of the slide, the uh, There is also an Italian chapter, so you are more than uh, get in touch with. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And at this stage, I would like to introduce Federico Arpi from FSCARI. He is a research fellow at the University of Modena and Reggio Emilio from August 2020. He graduated in Armenology at the University of Bologna and obtained his PhD in Oriental Studies from the University of Pisa. The stage is yours. Thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, for your invitation. I wish, uh, I wanted to thank you, Professor Kamiz, uh, uh, who is the reason why I'm here because we had a, a short meeting and uh, he thought uh, it could be a good idea uh, for me to bring uh, my salutations on behalf uh, of uh, our organization. Uh, thank you for the spelling uh, that that was correct uh, for especially italian colleagues we can uh, we can use uh, f shire which is uh, a bit uh, uh, a bit easier uh, if i can just share uh, the screen here it is right well um, um, our uh, our institution uh, uh, Shire uh, is tied to an European infrastructure which is uh, emerging right now, uh, which is uh, based about religious studies. It is called resilience, and I guess it is not uh, uh, completely unrelated to the themes you are you are discussing today and in this um, uh, summer school. Uh, our um, Fire uh, is a uh, is a foundation for religious uh, studies sciences uh, we say in Italian. It was funded uh, in Bologna in, in 1953 by Giuseppe Dossetti uh, and di directed by uh, his su successor Giuseppe Alberigo until 2007. We focus on the study uh, of. Um, religions uh, in general, with particular regard to Christianity, Islam, and the religions with which they have been in contact. We have two uh, uh, main libraries, uh, one uh, in Bologna, the Dossetti Library, of which uh, you see a picture here, um, an old picture actually, it has been renovated recently, and the La Pira Library in Palermo, and you can see the website if you want more uh, information about that. As a FSHIRE, we are leaders uh, of the resilience infrastructure, uh, which is meant to be uh, a dedicated infrastructure for religious studies. Uh, we are in the uh, preparatory phase uh, now, and we have a strong digital 
um, focus, especially as far uh, as uh, tools uh, and big data for scholars uh, are involved. And again, urban activity uh, has something to do uh, with, the, with that, and also population, depopulation and repopulation of sites. Uh, we, uh, as resilience, need a consortium of uh, many universities and research institutions in Europe. You can see uh, the, 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 the number of institutions here. And uh, our goals, again, are uh, to promote uh, the religious studies in Europe and to provide services for researchers. This is what an infrastructure mainly does. Uh, it was important for us uh, to be here today to uh, wish you uh, a good work uh, and uh, uh, um, to, to, to illustrate what are our goals, need, um, how we can, if you think so, uh, provide support to your needs. And here you can also see a, a small uh, 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 a small timeline of uh, uh, of what the infrastructure is is going to be and will be also later in the future. As you can see, it's a long term uh, project, so uh, take that in, into consideration. Uh, we want to help you uh, in uh, enhancing your research, uh, enabling more research, and uh, and also supporting uh, as far as research data management is concerned, especially, of course, for religious studies. Uh, that's all. Let's uh, stay in touch, if you wish, and thank you again for uh, this uh, opportunity and uh, good work. Thank you for your remarks. Sorry, just to note, I would like to re remind uh, Federico that on Sunday at five o'clock, we should have a speech by the Bishop of Sulmona. So that might help out with the networking. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, please let me introduce Imran Shahin. Dr. Shahin is a senior lecturer and the chair of the Department of Architecture in Ozean University in Istanbul having obtained his PhD in the field of architecture design from Mildes Technical University. He served as a visiting scholar at Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture in the academic year of 2000. Majority of his work has concentrated on the design of social and residential buildings. The floor is yours. Sorry. It's all right. I think yes, it's now. Okay. okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, dear students, speakers, organizers, dear distinguished participants and guests, uh, good morning again. Uh, welcome to the conference, uh, Reviving Depopulated Towns, uh, Documentation Preservation Design. I'm, I'm really glad to address to you uh, in this conference, which links the education, research, preservation, and design issues. Uh, well, um, Firstly, I should thank the organizer of the conference and the summer school, especially to Professor Kamis. Thank you, Professor, with your energy and your high level of resilience and enthusiasm, you have been a great role model for our students. Uh, along with Professor Kamis, I should also thank to all the members of the organizing committee and collaborators and partners for putting their honest effort to make this event special. And many thanks to you, the main actors of the event, the distinguished speakers, chairs, and the authors of the, your valuable, for your valuable contribution to the conference in your holiday season with your enlightening studies. I don't want to take uh, your time with a long speech, but I would like to leave the stage to the main actors of this event to you. Uh, besides destructive effect, effects to monstrous construction activities and growth of the cities, um, uh, more than that, due to the abandonment and depopulation of the existing settlements, we have been losing lots of our values. Genghis Bektash, a leading modern Turkish architect and poet who passed away recently always states that if a building doesn't meet the heat of a human being, it cannot survive. Hence, I find it very important that this conference and the summer school focus on such significant topic and problem through a unique uh, 
instance, uh, congratulations. Uh, as a very young faculty and department, uh, Özyen University Architecture Program was founded in 2012 in parallel with the development of the university and faculty. It has expanded its facilities, faculty and student body in a short period of time. Now it comprises two parallel departments. One is conducted in English and the other Turkish, plus new graduates and uh, PhD programs with over 700 students and 40 full-time professors, beside many part-time instructors, six research assistants, and a group of hardworking staff. Uh, all in all, the program aspires to become one of the leading accredited schools in architecture as part of a progressive research university. And now I have it as a major task in my agenda. Uh, next year, we're planning to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the establishment, our Faculty of Architecture and Design. By this means, uh, I would really like to invite you in person to our campus in Istanbul. We are very enthusiastic for academic collaborations and projects. You can respond to the calls of forthcoming events or you can suggest a new project. Please feel free to contact with Professor Kamis or with me. Uh, one way or the other, you are more than welcome. Before ending my speech, I should extend my thanks to you all once again. Thanks for your participation to the conference with your marvelous studies. I wish you a fruitful, productive conference and full of health. Thank you for joining and listening. Thank you, Professor. And I would like to introduce you Lorenzo Pignatti. He teaches design at the Faculty of Architecture in Pescara and the School of Architecture of the University of Waterloo, where he is also a director of Rome program. He has been involved in various academic exchanges and research projects between uh, the two institutions and has promoted a large number of cultural initiatives and publications. He is principal with Federico Ottoni in Ottoni Pignatti Studio Associato in Rome, whose work is mostly related to the design of public spaces and to the rehabilitation of urban sites, the stage is yours. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning to everybody. Thank you for inviting me to the, to, can you hear me? Okay, so good morning to everybody. Thank you for inviting me to the um, inauguration of this uh, workshop. Uh, I'm the director of the Department of Architecture uh, in Pescara. Somehow, I think we are the closest uh, school of architecture to Castelvecchio. So, uh, you know, we feel that uh, you're working um, somehow within our um, territory and we're very happy about this. Uh, so thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Alessandro Cam. It's, you know, we have been, uh, uh, you have been organizing uh, many, many activities. We have been done many, many things together. So I'm really happy uh, that uh, this collaboration between uh, you and the Department of Architecture in Pescara is continuing. Uh, but also I have uh, seen many old friends, uh, Tom Rankin. Uh, well, there is my colleague, uh, Massimo Angrilli, there is Tom Rankin, uh, and there also there is uh, Zoran Dukanovic uh, from Belgrade. Uh, and I'm kind of, you know, uh, saying hello to everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have, uh, to be here with um, uh, many good friends. Um, now, um, and, I, and I should say that uh, uh, Massimo Angrilli together with Claudio Varagnoli and uh, and, uh, and Donatella Radogna and, and Carlo Mazzanti will also uh, give some lectures within the, uh, within the, within the workshop. And so uh, I think, and also there's one student from the University of Pescara. So I'm very glad that this sort of uh, uh, collaboration between uh, our department and uh, your initiative uh, is uh, solid and strong. Um, being in Pescara, uh, we have two things. Uh, we have the Adriatic Sea uh, in front of us and we have the mountains behind us. Right, and in the mountains, uh, there is a large number of uh, beautiful uh, little towns, uh, uh, kind of you know, built uh, on the mountains in remote areas, right? You know, and this is one. Uh, I mean, as I said, one thing is the Adriatic, one thing is the kind of you know inland area, 
uh, which is very, very rich, right? You know, it's rich of actually uh, kind of, you know, small towns that have great uh, kind of um, ecological condition, they have great environmental condition. Very often also they have great buildings and great architecture and great uh, art. So it is really um, a heritage that is very, very important. In Italy, we are uh, in the last years also due, unfortunately, to a series of, um, of earthquakes, right? You know, that unfortunately have hit uh, the internal part of Italy. Um, but we're developing a great deal of attention uh, to uh, the reconstruction of these little towns, large and little towns after the uh, seismic events, but also uh, the kind of, you know, we're dealing, we're putting a lot of attention because uh, these uh, small towns need help, need uh, attention. There is a depopulation that is going on that, uh, that is actually kind of leaving these places uh, almost empty. And, um, and um, the, not only universities, but I think that um, there's a large number of people that are really working uh, with ideas, with with strategies, with uh, with um, anything that is possible to uh, to redevelop these places, to try to find a sort of you know future for these places that they can be somehow uh, you know uh, once again protagonists of these internal areas. So for us, it's a very important issue, right? You know, and 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 the center of Italy. The center line of Italy is really kind of, you know, uh, completely uh, inhabited with, um, with small towns like Servecchio, sometimes larger, sometimes smaller, but, you know, with the kind of, you know, what we call centri minori, right, you know, uh, that um, are, re are really important for, um, for I mean, it's, it's a very important issue to kind of, you know, look at them and, um, and uh, give them a, a great deal of attention. So uh, thank you for addressing this. You know, it would be much easier somehow to go into kind of, you know, uh, urban cities, right, you know, and, and, and develop ideas, but it's way more difficult, but way more important uh, to go in smaller centers and somehow develop ideas uh, and strategies for their redevelopment, for their uh, ecological and environmental redevelopment. We certainly do not want to see uh, kind of major transformation, but we want to see a slow transformation uh, that is uh, uh, kind of consistent and, uh, and sustainable uh, at the same time. The second thing I would like to say is that um, having obviously, as many of you, work uh, in the university, uh, uh, being a teacher for many, many years, uh, I really think that the most uh, valid uh, mom moments of instruction are the workshops, right? You know, uh, uh, you know, in our uh, universities, we have courses that, that are one term long, sometimes two terms long, right? You know, two academic terms. But very often we organize workshops, you know, intensive, uh, short workshops uh, where the students really kind of, you know, uh, merge into uh, the topic that they're doing, right? You know, and from a didactic point of view, I think that a short workshop is way more um, productive, right, you know, rather than a normal academic course. So I really think that these sort of, you know, summer workshops that uh, you are developing are, are <coughs> excuse me, are very important, uh, again, for both uh, giving uh, new ideas to Castel Vecchio, but also to our, to our students, to the participating students that they are uh, uh, kind of, you know, getting a great uh, experience. Unfortunately, this is done online. It will be way, way more, uh, more uh, efficient and beautiful to be, you know, there, to be, uh, to be, uh, you know, in the place, in the town. But uh, uh, conditions are not uh, helping us at this moment. But at the same time, it, somehow we have to be to be positive and think that also online things like that could be done. So thank you, Alessandro. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Professor. And please let me introduce you Roberto Spallone, who is an architect, full professor at the Politecnico di Torino, Department of Architecture and Design. She teaches in the Laboratory of Drawing and Survey and Digital Techniques of Representation. She carried on research in the fields of history and criticism of architectural drawing and digital techniques of representation. More recent studies concern the links between digital modeling, artificial intelligence, and augmented reality for enhancing built heritage. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ozzy. Uh, Fabrizio Nata, could you share the image? Thank you, Fabrizio. This is uh, uh, 
uh, our uh, work, the work of the last week. Uh, I'm Roberta Spallone. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I represent uh, the Polytechnico di Torino's group. Uh, we will work during uh, the summer school. <clears throat> I would like uh, to thank uh, Professor Tom Ranking and Professor Alessandro Kamitz for inviting us uh, to participate in the activities of the International Architecture Summer School in Castelvecchio Calvisio. This is the second year that we have participating uh, in the summer school. The result uh, of uh, the last uh, year's work were uh, very interesting, and I'm sure uh, we will improve again this year. When um, I was called uh, to participate in uh, this uh, educational project uh, <coughs> at the end of 2019, uh, I joined with uh, enthusiasm remembering uh, the singular beauty of those places uh, close uh, to my family native uh, uh, land. I immediately involved the group uh, coordinator, Professor Marco Vitali, and uh, PhDs, uh, architects uh, Giulia Bertola, Fabrizio Natta, and Francesca Ronco, who will collaborate in the activities uh, as tutors. Our uh, expertise range uh, from survey, drawing, digital modeling, and digital fabrication. Uh, in this regard, this week we worked uh, on uh, this project. Uh, we worked a lot uh, in the model lab of Politecnico uh, to digitally realize a big scale map of Castelvecchio uh, printed only in oleum. This morning uh, we have sent it uh, to Castelvecchio and we think that in a couple of days, the map will be in the hands of the major Dr. Luigi Antonacci. So uh, I want to thank uh, Tom and Alessandro because uh, even in this condition of emergency, uh, they uh, contributed to the announcement of uh, heritage at uh, high risk of solutions. Uh, we are with uh, you, with the students, uh, with uh, uh, the group uh, who is uh, in Castelvecchio, uh, even if uh, at a distance. We and mainly Marco, Giulia, Fabrizio and Francesca, we will meet uh, several times uh, in the coming days. Many greetings and best wishes for the summer school to all of you. Thank you. And I would like to introduce you Luigi Pasciani, who is the mayor of Comune de Molina Tano, our area integra, interna Gran Sasso Subeguano. He is the ENCI representative for the province of L'Aquila. He is mayor of Molina from 1999 to 2010, from 2015 to today, head of the civil protection of the municipality from 1999 to today. The floor is yours. I think you're muted. Buongiorno. And now we can hear you. Devo, io parlo in italiano naturalmente. Eh, non so se non so se riesco a farvi vedere perché eh, la connessione è un po' diciamo che non ce la fa a supportare la visibilità del dell'ambiente, quindi la mia visibilità. Adesso ci provo e vediamo. Buongiorno, eh, Tom, are you able to translate, translate this? Tom, I, se ti può tradurre. I, però... I'm, on, I'm on Dan Price's computer and I can try to translate. Um, we're just about to move. Alessandro, if you could do it, it would be more reliable though. Ok, so io tradurrò dal, dall'italiano all'inglese, però bisognerebbe fare un, una frase breve, una o due frasi brevi e poi io traduco, va bene? Perfetto, va bene, va bene. Insomma, mi avete, eh, buongiorno di nuovo, mi avete presentato quindi 
sapete eh, chi sono. Grazie. So, uh, he was introduced and you all know who he is. L'area interna, Gran Sasso Valle Subequana, è l'area interna tra le aree interne. So, the internal area, Gran Sasso Subequana, is the internal area of the internal area. This is an administrative organization for the smaller territories, mountain territories, area interna. Okay. È costituita da 24 comuni, tutti piccoli, con una popolazione inferiore ai mille abitanti. It, hold, it holds inside the area interna 24 municipalities, all of them are very small municipalities, all with uh, less than 1,000 inhabitants. Caratterizzata da una numerosa presenza percentuali elevatissime di uh, anziani, And of course, the number of old people in these uh, territories is very high. È il grande patrimonio naturale con il Parco Nazionale Gran Sasso della Laga, e il Parco Regionale Sirente Velino e culturale con chiese, castelli, palazzi storici di cui godiamo è da sempre del buon mente valorizzato. And this territory holds inside two national parks and an amount of churches, monasteries, castles, and archaeological areas, very rich in nature and heritage, but not as much enhanced as it should be. L'economia è fragile, ruota intorno all'agricoltura, all'edilizia, al commercio, ma non è sufficiente a garantire occupazione e non è sufficiente affinché i giovani possano rimanere sul nostro territorio. The economy uh, locally is very fragile, mostly based on agriculture, building uh, constructions and uh, commerce, but these activities are not strong enough to provide occupation, especially for the young people. Uh, questo, unito ad un calo delle nascite e, e all'esodo appunto della popolazione giovanile, uh, alla re rarefazione dei servizi, e all'assenza di opportunità appunto di lavoro, come dicevamo, ha determinato un processo di forte spopolamento eh, che è destinato a peggiorare se non si prova subito ad invertire la tendenza. So all these economical factors have in the last decades uh, moved population away from these places uh, also because the, the birth rate, rate has uh, reduced in the past decades So if this trend is not inverted in the future, the depopulation process will increase dramatically and become even worse than it is now. In questo, uh, in, in questo percorso si innesta la strategia e la programmazione per le aree interne, che consta di quattro interventi fondamentali. So the aree interne... Um, office is yes, can you hear me? The area interne office is dealing with these economical factors in terms of planning and the policy is based on four um, pillars. La strategia che ammonda 7 milioni e mezzo di euro si innesta su quattro assi servizi quindi istruzione, sanità e mobilità, sviluppo locale, risorse agricole e forestali, turismo, lavoro, cultura, economia sociale, associazionismo, quindi processi associativi di governance, e assistenza tecnica e un supporto tecnico all'attuazione della stessa. So the strategy which is based on more than 7 million euros uh, is based on a number of different Um, guidelines, uh, I'm not sure if I remember all of them, but heritage, uh, tourism, uh, local products, and uh, uh, local association, NGOs, and a number of, of other fields in where the investments could boost the economy and the population, repopulation. Allora, quindi non entro nel dettaglio su una serie di progetti, ma sono relativi all'istruzione per un milione di euro, 
alla sanità per un milione e duecentomila euro, eh, alla mobilità sostenibile per un milione e centomila euro eh, e, e, e tre progetti allo sviluppo di imprese alla formazione per un milione e centocinquantamila euro e così via. Eh, risorse ingenti per una popolazione all'interno della stessa che consta intorno agli 8.000 abitanti. Uh, within the, num the different projects uh, and the, uh, the, the money is dedicated to different activities such as the health care, the um, sustainable transportation, education, education um, and so for overall population that is not more in this territory of 8,000 people. Ad oggi... Eh, dopo una lunga e laboriosa fase di progettazione partecipata eh, che ha coinvolto numerosi attori eh, del territorio del progetto dell'area interna Gran Sasso Valle Subbequana è arrivata alla fase operativa. Uh, so in this stage the area interna Gran Sasso Subbequana has reached the operative phase of its activities è stato avviato l'iter per la sottoscrizione dell'accordo di programma quadro già sottoscritto dalla regione Abruzzo dal sindaco, dal sindaco del comune Capofila da due ministeri e quindi devono firmarlo altri quattro ministeri e poi possiamo iniziare eh, il lavoro con eh, la progettualità eh, e l'esecutività dei progetti So the uh, agreement has been signed for these activities by the Regione Abruzzo, the, the le leading municipality and one ministry and still awaiting the signature by two other national ministries. Then, then this program will be op operative and it will be possible to enter the, um, the, the, the phase in which these strategies are deployed. Eh, per essere più precisi, il Ministero dell'Istruzione, il Ministero della Sanità, il eh, Ministero dei Trasporti e il Ministero delle Infrastrutture. Ministri still who should be signing our infrastructure, uh, health and education. I miss someone. Sanitaria. Yes. Quindi gli obiettivi fissati dalla strategia nella nostra area sono diversi ed ambiziosi. Uh, there are different aims in, within the strategy, all of them very important and effective. Stiamo puntando a garantire ad innovare i servizi di cittadinanza, il benessere dei residenti ed arrestare il declino demografico. Uh, starting from the uh, well-being of the inhabitants and uh, so to prevent the depopulation process. A rivitalizzare le filiere locali, a favorire la permanenza, il rientro dei giovani sul territorio, trasformando loro in attrattori di nuove residenze e creando nuove occasioni di lavoro. Especially working on the young uh, people, so measures that can help them to come back to the local residents through opportunities of uh, development and, and jobs also, of course. Ma soprattutto a fare rete tra i comuni con una gestione associata di funzioni e servizi e rendere stabile permanente l'organizzazione della strategia che abbiamo creato in questa fase. And moreover, in creating a permanent network of the local municipalities in a way that they can cooperate in the future within the strategy to improve the local um, economy. Che ci consentirà di eh, attrarre eh, ulteriori finanziamenti europei anche attraverso eh, il piano nazionale di ripresa e resilienza. In order to be able to uh, find further uh, sources of, of Uh, you know, money from, especially from the European community and other national initiatives. Anche perché eh, molte, molti risorse, molti finanziamenti del, del piano nazionale, del Next Generation EU, eh, sono indirizzate ai piccoli comuni e alle aree interne. 
uh, also because within the national program, um, there is a, a chapter funding small uh, towns. E questo ci consentirà di dare centralità uh, uh, alle aree interne abruzzesi. And so with this in mind, it will be possible to give new visibility and uh, importance to these internal areas. With internal areas is a, a way of, of mentioning these territories on the Apennines with small towns. Questo anche alla luce di un cambiato mondo in piena pandemia Covid eh, che ha riscoperto eh, i luoghi prossimi, quindi le aree interne, luoghi capaci di offrire eh, paesaggi contaminati e attività <coughs> che per caratteristiche proprie non contrastano con le norme anticontagio. Uh, also, because in this phase, within the pandemics, it seems like these dispersed territories, internal areas, have a new attraction because being in those areas, low density, does not um, conflict with the social distancing rules that are instead uh, sometimes in action within the metropolitan areas. Quindi il progetto rappresenta una grossa opportunità, una delle poche che in un periodo che negli ultimi anni ci è stata, come dire, eh, consentita. Eh, ed è per questo che tutti, tutti gli amministratori, tutti i sindaci stanno, come dire, eh, rivolgendo tutte le attenzioni su questo programma e su questo progetto. So this is a new opportunity uh, and it's very important that all the municipalities are in contact and they follow up the process because this will be will, will bring in the next in, in the near future uh, development con l'auspicio che possiamo mettere a terra uh, questi interventi nel più breve tempo possibile uh, volevo ringraziarvi per per avermi ascoltato e per uh, come dire essere entrati anche voi insieme a noi uh, all'interno di questo progetto grazie so hoping that uh, we continue this process together and thanking you all for being part of this process uh what i wanted to say thank you and uh goodbye thank Love you me. very much and it is almost 10 o'clock in castelvecchio calvicio and we will shortly begin with the morning session of the conference so i will leave the stage to my colleague luai al hussein Uh, sorry, just a check on the program. Did we miss or skip any one of our guests? Uh, Only Domenico Di Cesare, which I didn't see on the list. Okay, is Domenico Di Cesare or anyone from the municipality uh, uh, of Carapelle Calvisio here? Abbiamo tagliato quello dell'altra. C'è nessuno di Carapelle Calvisio, Domenico Di Cesare o qualcun altro? Qualcuno che ha il microfono acceso, Alessandro, sentivo parlare prima. C'è nessuno per Carapelle Calvisio? No. So we can move on to the next stage. Thank you. Ok. So shall we begin? Professor Camis, or would you like to, to give the audience a little bit of time until we start? No, 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 we have to start. All right. So, uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm, I'll be uh, happy to chair the session that's uh, coming. Let me at first introduce myself. Uh, my name is Luay. I am uh, an architect and I am a master's student at Ozin University. Um, I'm also a part-time architect uh, uh, working in Istanbul, Turkey. So let's uh, go into the morning session uh, program. So our uh, session will start uh, by uh, uh, a program that is with a number of, uh, of presentations. And it, uh, it's supposed to start at 10, but we started before ahead and it will finish at 1.30 uh, p.m. Uh, Rome time. 
Uh, so I would like to remind everybody that uh, the time is for each speaker is 20 minutes. And uh, also questions and answers will be uh, given in the end of the session uh, uh, for 30 minutes. So you will be, uh, you'll be invited to uh, please be with us until that time to ask and uh, 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 the uh, audience and the presenters uh, questions and discussion. Uh, I would like to remind everybody that we have also hashtag. So if you like to uh, comment or if you like to share the event, you're welcome to do so on this hashtag. So at uh, the first, uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Per Elias Cornell. Uh, from University of Gothenburg. Uh, he will be introducing with us a built environment, landscape, and time. Uh, Professor Per Elias has an ample experience of teaching at all university levels, both at PA uh, and MA level, including many master theses. Uh, Professor El uh, Per Elias has ample experience of making new courses and programs has brought 15 doctoral candidates to successful defense in the capacity of main supervisor and many more in their and other roles. Professor Cornell has worked with research and teaching in Argentina, Bolivia, Mexico, uh, uh, Nicaragua, and other countries in Latin America, but also in South Asia and Europe. Ample experience of archaeological fieldwork, main, mainly from Latin America, but also from examples uh, of Sweden and Italy, Sicilia, and from Catalonia. Uh, he has a long list of publications, also from recent years, published in different formats. Uh, professor, the uh, stage is yours. Thanks. I, I hope you can hear me. I will share screen. Yes, we hear you. Thank you. Um, this is a very uh, interesting uh, workshop and a very interesting summer school. And Castel Vecchio Calvisia is a wonderful place. So I think it will become a, a couple of very interesting days. Uh, unfortunately, I will not be able to follow all the activities, but I will appear at certain uh, occasions during these days. And this presentation will be very uh, general, um, just addressing some uh, issues that I find very important when we discuss and talk about built environment, landscape and time. Uh, first and foremost, of course, it's very interesting to, to think about settlements in general, uh, in a way. And, um, <clears throat> settlement uh, patterns may vary considerably. We look at it at a general perspective globally and over time. They are highly different. Uh, and uh, they can be very small, uh, scattered settlements over large areas, or they can be gigantic, large, dense settlements. They can have different forms, etc. They can be built with different kinds of materials, etc. This, of course, depends on a lot of factors, socioeconomy, political forms, the natural environment, building techniques, and pre-existing built environment are important factors, but also others intervene, of course. And uh, just to take two examples of contrasting settlement patterns, if you look at the Andean region, uh, circa 1400 AD, we see a, a system with basically small, very small settlements, very distributed widely over a gigantic landscape. If you look at the central plateau in Mexico, 600 AD, we see the opposite, one gigantic settlement dominating the whole region and an absence of smaller settlements. Um, so these gigantic contrasts are typical for settlement patterns across time and space. What causes forms? Of course, it can be uh, complex plans. That is a very important part of this. Uh, but they can also arise from very simple lines put across the landscape, uh, followed by the construction of buildings of similar forms and sizes because of a common tradition. And th this can also result in what seems to be a very typical and recognizable plan. Uh, of course, there are several different forms of change. They are seldom complete and absolute, seldom incorporate everything. Uh, certain things continue, others change. The first settlers at a place must not necessarily and always have a major impact on later developments. If we look at Rome during Augustus or Rome today, 
This cannot be explained, of course, from the actions of Bronze Age settlers in the area. So there are different kinds of change, like evolution, involution, revolution, rupture, and abandonment, of course. Now, all these can operate together in certain circumstances. So thinking about change is more complex than we often think. The idea of uh, Thomas More in his utopia thinking, the completely new settlement, is not a very common phenomenon. The first attempts to apply his discussion, by the way, were done in the Spanish colony in today's Mexico, Puebla, in the 16th century, including mainly uh, indigenous populations. And these settlements, of course, changed very quickly, it became something completely different from what Moore had intended. Uh, they have been studied by historians and archaeologists, and it's quite an interesting topic, actually. Uh, several modernist planners had similar ideas as, as, as more that we should create always new settlements. Le Corbusier, for example, at some point suggested that the town should last no longer than 50 years, and then we should create something else. But actually, and what we can see uh, across time is that most settlements do survive longer, and they reappear, they decline, they go on growing, and so on. Uh, so the relation between different times becomes crucial for discussing given settlements. Uh, there has been a very common idea that settlements should uh, be seen as uh, a reflection of the socioeconomic and the politic, political frame. This is not as simple as some theorists have thought. For example, the sociologist Stuart Kaiman also believed that the settlement plan represented the whole society. Things are not that easy and simple. The same skeletal organization of walls may represent quite different things in different time periods. We must look at the details to find what actually happened in a given built environment. And he might actually criticize this notion which he had had himself that in making a new place, Brasilia, from scratch, they would create a new society. That was not the case. Uh, but still, despite the fact that there is no direct link between building and, and society, this has all, often been thought to be the case, and at times in a dramatic way. Just take one example. When the Nazis tried to, to suppress partisans in Marseille, they found an identity between the old town of Marseille and the partisan movement and decided to demolish two thirds of the old town of Marseille. That was a very strange way of using resources in 1943, I think. If you are in a big war, that is not a rational act to destroy medieval buildings, but that was actually what happened. The, Realities within a given settlement may vary considerably, even in the architectural forms. I, I will give dramatic examples here from Mexico. Cancun today, this is the hotel zone. This is the 1960s original center of Cancun, a different kind of architecture. This is how most of the population of Cancun actually lives in traditional huts. And some people live in more precarious uh, organized buildings. All these exist at the same time, at the same place, and people relate to each other despite living in so different architectural frames. The built environment always operates in a landscape. That is a very important thing, something that I think we must recognize and take into consideration much more than several architects have been willing to do. And time is always a crucial factor. And there has always been a conscious relationship also when we talk about built environments. A sort of intention to copy, iterate old forms and designs all by placing new time things in relation to the old. The center of Mexico today, the town of Mexico, the Ciudad de Mexico, is placed at the place of an other town, Tenochtitlan, which the Spanish colonizers found. And the large central square in Ciudad de Mexico is actually the square of Tenochtitlan. 
So here we see certain strange continuities over time and the relation to the past in an intriguing way. Um, of course, we can see how we try to copy old architecture in different ways, often fails in doing so. And we often build things uh, very close by to uh, old constructions to relate to the past in different ways. This is not something only happening in Europe. We find similar things across the globe in different time periods. This is an example from Mexico again, from a Maya setting uh, in the state of Campeche, Yucatan Peninsula. Here, an old pyramid uh, from 600 has been transformed into something else with new buildings on its foot uh, in the 13th century. They were intentionally placed just below the stairs to relate to an old building, which was in ruined state uh, in the 13th century. So the ruin was actually of interest to the Mayans already in that period. And they wanted to relate to that ruin through new constructions. So this is not only a European pattern or way of thinking, this way of relating to the past. The context of an old construction may change considerably. I cannot enter into details here. This is the Port of Caviana in Rome. Um, we have the classical situation in, in ancient Rome in times of Augustus when this was constructed, but um, it changed considerably over time. Uh, just one example, when the Pope gave space for Jewish populations running away from, from uh, Spain, in the end of, of the 16th century, they are allowed to live here in this area. And this uh, Porto Octavian becomes the place for selling fish. And they use old uh, marble blocks from ancient buildings to cut and sell and exhibit the fish. And this continues for several centuries and is finished only the end of the uh, 19th century. And today it's this completely different settings and uh, it is discussing, today the architecture and the names of the places discuss the horrible persecution of Jews in the 1940s. So the same place with partially the same buildings has completely different meanings and uses across time. Uh, there are interesting theories. I will not enter a uh, wider discussion on this now, that would be another occasion. Patrick Geddes is, of course, very interesting. And his this in evolution from 1915 is still very interesting. He suggested new methods for documentation and for collection of data. That was very important. He saw the old things as important also in the present. And he suggested conservative surgery as a major method in settlement change, minor operations of transformation, which is probably of, of relevance when discussing uh, Castelvecchio Calvicio. But there are also problems, I think, uh, this idea of the organic, uh, this is also to him linked to the concept of spirit, the spirit of place. Uh, these can be used, of course, as terms if we do not consider them concepts. But if they are given deeper meaning, as in Geddes' works, they may become strange and difficult. Uh, in contrast to many other uh, theorists, he considered the spirit to have both good and bad sides. So that is a subtlety, particular to, to Geddes. But I do not think that the same spirit lives forever at a place, despite the worlds being the same. There are big transformations. Certain small things may continue, but a lot of things change. And the general spirit hardly lives that long, not over the millennia at least. So the change is very crucial. That would not exclude the use of older buildings, but in new ways. I think thinking about these issues is very important for planners, architects, for people from different disciplines like history, archaeology, sociology, political science, and so on. But above all, for people in general, these are crucial questions for life, and they should be discussed much more in the public debate. And thus, this uh, workshop is very important and very interesting. and makes an important contribution, certainly, to this important topic. Just a small 
uh, reflection from my own uh, experience of Italy in the 1970s when I was young. I do not know much about the Bruzzo area. I do not know if there are cellars in Castelvecchio, Calvisio, but in certain areas, which I visited as a kid, around Rome, for example, the cellars were very important and were crucial for the social life. Today, they are generally closed. Uh, so I visited the same places and the use of space has been transformed completely from the 1970s. It's a short period of time that the use of space has changed completely, dramatically. Uh, and that is quite interesting. It need not be exactly the cellars, but the ways of using space may change dramatically over time. It could be interesting to look a little bit at history and see how space was actually used in different decades and in different periods to find and discover these activities which are of major importance for understanding space and time. Thanks for listening. If you wish to uh, contact me, you could use this email, this email address. I can also send you the, my, my PowerPoint if somebody would be interested to look close at it. Uh, thanks and good luck with this conference. Uh, I will try to appear a little bit later today to be, uh, if anybody had questions during the last 30 minutes of, of the morning session. Thank thanks. you very much. We have five minutes uh, more. If anybody would like to raise any question or have any comments, please do so before going to the next speaker. I guess people need to ponder and think about what each particular uh, contributor speaks and discuss. So it's perhaps better if they return in terms of communicating via email or in other ways or in the 30 minutes discussion at the end of this session. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to be here today. I think this event is very important. And in particular, I would like to, to thank uh, Thomas Rienkin and Alessandro Camis for organizing this event. I, I would also like to say to the students that they are very lucky being participating uh, in this summer school. It's a wonderful event and it will be a couple of very hard but productive days. Thanks. Thank you very much. So the next speaker, uh, we have uh, Professor Massimo Angrelli from University degli Studi uh, di An 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 Annunzio, Chieta Bescara. Uh, uh, Professor Massimo Angrelli is an architect and a PhD. Uh, he studied at the architecture faculty of Bescara and Paris Tolbiac. He received a PhD in urbanism at the Inter-University Doctorate of Rome Bescara in 2000, with a thesis entitled as Green Urban Network with the landscape architect Michael Hoff of University of Toronto as external tutor. He is a deputy director and associate professor in urban design at the architecture department of Pescara and visiting professor in the international master's degree of landscape intervention and heritage management. Um, uh, is, uh, professor Professor uh, Angrelli is an author, among others, of the books of, of landscape project plan, urban planning, and recovery of the common good. So welcome, uh, Professor Massimo, and the stage is yours. Uh, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the title of the presentation is Centrality and Marginality of the Abruzzo Apennini Territories. So please, uh, Professor, stage is yours. Thank you, Luai. Um, let me share my screen. In a minute. Uh -huh. Okay, now, now you should be able, yes. you should be able to see the cover in full screen of my presentation. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Hi everyone, you already know me because I, um, I had a brief speech yesterday for presenting my, um, my session, my team, which is the landscape team with Valentina Sufreda. And, and so um, 
today my in intervention uh, has the objective of speaking about the marginality of um, the territory of the Abruzzo Apennine range. Uh, talking about also uh, of the past, um, the past age where this same territory was central, um, not only for demographic condition, but also for economic condition. You will see the, the demographic data and the, um, the, the centrality of this territory in terms of uh, um, economy. And uh, despite the, the altitude, these uh, central territories, these internal territories that today we define marginal, uh, at least until the beginning of the 20th century, uh, were absolutely central territories. Um, you will see in this presentation, the first results of a degree laboratory that I conducted in the last years on, on the subject of the internal areas of Abruzzo and which constitutes an essential part of a research I've been doing for, for some time. So you already uh, heard by the introduction of the uh, mayor of uh, um, one of the municipality, Molina Terno, uh, this national strategy, uh, which maybe the students um, uh, from non-Italian students, maybe mm, they don't know about it. So I would like to introduce the Italian strategy for internal areas, which is a, a national vision that distinguish the Italian territory in different areas. The uh, so-called pole, uh, the, the, the brown areas, the intermunicipality pole, the red um, areas, the pole belt, and those are, let's say, the um, more central and more uh, active uh, municipalities. And then we have the intermediate municipality, the peripheral municipality, and ultra peripheral municipality. Uh, and this relevant part of Italy, uh, the internal areas, the peripheral and ultra peripheral, has not taken advantage of the economic growth of the country. For this reason, um, this territory has maintained significant environmental and landscape resources and qualities that today may become uh, decisive, decisive factors for development, contributing to the recovery of the economic and social development of the entire country. So this is the idea of the national strategy, uh, taking advantage from uh, the, the biodiversity from the uh, landscape and also from the potentiality of the economy, of rural economy and green economy, of course, uh, most of all. And in this uh, national strategy, uh, the municipality, uh, which are 20 minutes far from a pole, um, uh, are the um, intermediate municipality. The peripheral municipality are those municipalities um, uh, far away from a, a pole, uh, 40 minutes far away from a pole, and the ultra peripheral are 75 minutes away from a pole. So the classification of the national strategy is based on the distance, that, on the time, not the distance, the time you need to move from your town to another town in which you will find education services, sanitary services, and all, the, all those kind of uh, facilities. So according from the distance, the time that you need to, to cover the distance, uh, you are classified as a peripheral or ultra peripheral municipality. Castelvecchio Calvisio, by the way, is classified as a peripheral municipality. Um, so uh, these are the image of the, 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 the Abruzzo internal uh, pilot areas because the national strategy is based on pilot areas, experiment, let's say experimental areas where 
uh, the national government um, funds the, um, the activities and the projects for um, the essential services, uh, education, health, and mobility. Uh, and this is the national mosaic of the uh, pilot areas for the uh, 2014 and 2020 period. So no, now we are at the end of this experimental stage of the national strategy. And we are in the, uh, let's say, implementation stage with the next generation U and the new 2021-27 uh, funding program. So let's see what will happen, how uh, the money that the government um, uh, established uh, will help these municipalities to, um, to, to, let's say, uh, to cover the gap of the development and of the uh, offer of services. So this is the clo a close up on the uh, Abruzzo region. And those are the five areas, the project areas selected by the government. Castel Vecchio del Visio is located in the Gran Sasso Valle Subequana area. So this orange area. And, and uh, as uh, already Fasciani said, this is an area of 24 <laughs> municipalities. Uh, all the municipalities are located in the L'Aquila district. And, and all the municipalities uh, fall into the internal areas category as peripheral municipalities and non ultra peripheral. So uh, peripheral, I mean, all of those 24 municipalities are peripheral. It means that they are uh, 40 minutes away from a pole. Uh, the entire entire area has a population of about 9,000 inhabitants, and the most populous municipality is Castelvecchio Subequo, with 1,000 residents. And the last, the least populous, is Carapelle Calvisio, with 83 inhabitants. And and the the decrease of of population uh, in in the period between uh, um, 97 uh, and 2011 uh, is uh, uh, 46 um, percent. So the, the decrease of the population, it's a very high rate. And um, out of uh, uh, 315 municipalities which make up the regional territory, 230 are classified as internal areas. And of these, 115 are peripheral and ultra peripheral. And most of them are concentrated in the mountain areas of the Apennine Ridge. And maybe there is someone with the microphone open. So I ask maybe the mayor, Luigi Antonacci, could you please spend your microphone, per favore? She muted already. Uh, Luigi Antonacci, please. Can you spend your microphone? Ah, it's not her. Okay. But, but I have. Um, okay. 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 I, I, I hear it coming from you. Oh, thank you. Um, and in, in this, um, uh, in, in this, let's say, uh, Apennine Ridge, um, live nearly 500,000 inhabitants, and which is the 37% of the regional population. Um, and these are the images of the pilot areas, and this is the focus on Castelvecchio del Visio, uh, which is, um, no, actually it's, it's not peripheral, it's intermediate town. So 20 minutes far from the nearest, nearest uh, node town. And this is the global view of the topographical condition of Bruzzo, which is an important factor because the um, isolation, as we will see soon, is one factor for the depopulation of this territory. Uh, so uh, the, the, the red pin stands for Castelvecchio Calvisio, and you can see here the system of the mountain range that you studied yesterday with the exercise um, based on the 
on the map. Uh, so um, now you, you, we are uh, entering um, the documents that uh, uh, we did um, as, a, as a laboratory in my school. Uh, this is again the Valle Subequana, Gran Sasso Valle Subequana strategical area, area for the implementation of the national strategy. This means that in those 24 minutes, the 7 million euros of the funding, of the government funding, will be um, deployed for all those projects regarding the, the pillars of the of the uh, social service, health, mobility, and uh, education. And, and um, so these are the um, research that, we, that we've been doing regarding the different uh, pilot areas. And this is the um, Gran Sasso Valle Subequana where Castelvecchio del Visio is. And this is the close up of this image. And the average population density of this area is 14 inhabitants per kil square kilometer. So to give you an idea, uh, Milano has a density of uh, 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 nearly 8,000 8, inhabitants per kilometer, uh, square kilometer. Rome, uh, nearly uh, 2,100 inhabitants per uh, square kilometer. So in this area, the average population density is 14 inhabitants per square kilometer. So today in Castelvecchio, there are more because uh, Tom Rankin and the other people uh, colonized the town. So this area is, um, as Luigi Fasciani already said, is characterized by a high presence of elderly people. The, 30% of the resident population are aging people. So low density and aging population, these are the main demographic character of the area. And here you can see the, the whole picture of the demographic classification of the 315 municipalities in Abruzzo. The clearer the area, the lower the population. The total whites, are municipalities with less than 1,000 residents. And you can see how many of those uh, white areas we uh, do have in the mountain, um, in the Apennine mountain um, ridge. So the, the demographic component in marginality is certainly, is certainly one of the most relevant. At the same time, the demographic component is the cause and effect of the problem itself. So there is no doubt that the presence of a, a critical mass of inhabitants represents a factor for the survival of a territory because of, because you know, uh, the services, education and uh, uh, health um, services can be effective with a, um, critical mass of population. Uh, so uh, there is one problem in, 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 uh, um, in, in my opinion, and this, the problem is uh, that it is not enough to bring back population if you are not able to transform this population into a community or at least if it is not able to establish with the place a link based on some form of belongings. Uh, I'm quoting the sociologist Aldo Bonomi. Uh, Bonomi says that uh, in towns affected by marginality, uh, the natural community has now uh, nearly dissolved. And it, it is therefore necessary to think of new forms of artificial communities, which establish a new awareness of places. The dissolution of the natural community is, is mainly uh, connected to the fact that the young people uh, goes away for, for study and then they make their lives elsewhere. In Castelvecchio Galvisio, now we, we, we go uh, in, in the um, uh, 
Gran Sasso Valle Subequana pilot area, and these are the demographic data that we collected in our research. And Castelvecchio Galvisio has uh, 127 residents, uh, more or less, uh, which is a condominium of 30 apartments. This is the average uh, dimension of, of a condominium. <clears throat> and and uh, the decrease of the population you can see from the, the graphics, it's uh, more or less uh, between the 50s and the, uh, the, the 21st century. Um, but in past centuries, I, I, as I was, uh, I was saying at the beginning of this uh, speech, in past centuries, the situation in this same territory was very different from a reconstruction made by a geographer. It appears that in the south, at the end of the 18th century, the mountain and internal hills uh, hosted 60% of the overall population and the settlement structure of the country was mainly represented by the mountain and the internal hills. So until the 19th century, the Apennine Mountains expressed a real economic and cultural centrality, which through the complex mechanism of transhumans and wool production extended well beyond regional borders. Uh, so let's say the Apennine in, in past centuries was the engine of the South. Uh, the majority of resources, population and services were concentrated actually. And, and this centrality made the Apennine the center of reference for the coastal area still underdeveloped. Uh, I live in Pescara, which is in the Adriatic coast. Uh, and in the past century, Adri the Adriatic coast was a plague of uh, um, swampy areas, it was inhabited. And the internal areas was the most uh, inhabited areas and the most rich, the richer area. Um, anyway, uh, the, in the past, the economy uh, was an economy that hardly sustained this rate of population growth. And the economy was based on agriculture, but mainly on farms. As you can see in this picture, uh, sheep farming was the major industry for these internal areas in uh, Abruzzo region. Um, Southern Italy uh, was, after Castilla in Spain, was the largest producer of raw wool in Europe especially for the transformation and marketing of the national and international market. And, and you, you can still observe in the landscape, those strips of land, 110 meter wide. Professor, uh, uh, sorry to yeah, interrupt. Yes. You, have, yes. you have two minutes left, please. Um, just to let you know. Thank okay. You. Maybe we, we are early with the, with the schedule, so maybe I can. Take yes, yes, you can. Few minutes, course. yeah. Of course. Okay. And so the tratturo, cattle truck, that represented a sort of highways for the transhumans, which which was a seasonal movement of livestock between summer and winter pasture. Uh, so the, from Abruzzo, the cattle migrated to the south to Puglia, to Puglia region, and this is the network of the many cattle truck linking Abruzzo with Puglia, Abruzzo. Puglia. Um, alongside breeding and agriculture, there was also a variety of jobs that completed the subsistence, subsistence economy of the mountain. Uh, so you can see trade in wood for the use of heating, production of coal and timber, uh, manufacture of wooden objects and tools for domestic and agricultural uses home spinning and weaving of wool, hemp and lining and more. And also the practice of seasonal work was also very widespread involving 
the men of the Apennine Mountains outside their place of residence for long periods. So in the Apennine Mountains, the population was a nomadic population for the transhumans, but also for the seasonal works, working in uh, construction sites, in land reclamation works for the uh, bonification of the Lazio territories. Uh, so many different kind of, um, of works. But coming back to the major industry, which is which was the herding industry, which sheep farming, <clears throat> the main cause for the demographic decline of the mountain was the decline of this economy, mainly due to the uh, globalization of the uh, wool production. Argentina and South America in general uh, they started to sell wool at lower prices than Italy. And this was alongside with the uh, agrarian reform of the uh, Tavoliere delle Puglie was the major factors for the decline of the economy of, the, of this industry. And you can see very clearly in Castel del Monte, today we meet the major of Castel del Monte, uh, with the demographic, that the demographic uh, decline is strictly linked with the uh, uh, decline of the uh, uh, breeding crisis, okay? <clears throat> uh, and also this decline of the industry was, the, was a factor for the migration of population. Uh, of course, the factors are interwoven between them. So in Castel del Monte, before the crisis and until the census of uh, 1921, uh, the, the, the rhythm of the in demographic increase was very good. Uh, and then the decline uh, after the 1921, uh, you can see in the, in the graphic was very uh, rapid. And for the internal regions of the Apennines, isolation is a, a recurring topos, which can be traced back above all to the difficulty, to the difficult orographic conditions imposed by the mountain range. And here you can read uh, a, a writing from Ignazio Silone, which was an important Italian writer it gives a very suggestive represent, representation of this isolation. And so he says that the mountains are the more overbearing character of the Abruzzo region. So the uh, particular conformation of the or orography explains the region's major paradox, which is that Abruzzo, located in central Italy, actually belongs to southern Italy. This was Ignesto Silone. Also, the harsh uh, climatic condition uh, are factors for the uh, uh, isolations in certain periods, periods of time of our, uh, our region. So the rigidity of the climate. Uh, in the past, Abruzzo was usually called the Siberia of the kingdom. The kingdom was the kingdom of Naples. So during the, this time, Abruzzo was the Siberia of the Naples kingdom. And here you are seeing Pesco Costanzo after the snowfall of 2017. So the isolation has not completely ceased with the innovations introduced by communication technologies. Uh, even today, the emergency of the digital divide exists for the internal areas of the country, of the country, which concern access to television, telephone, and broadband services for high-speed internet. So the digital divide, which you can see from this map, where the white areas are the so-called market failure areas. So those areas for which no operator, no private operator, in uh, telecommunication companies has intervened because there is no interest, market interest. And I go into the uh, closing of my uh, presentation, <clears throat> speaking of, uh, uh, of the neo-rural movement, 
uh, which, which was called uh, Back to the Countryside Movement, uh, which is one of the characteristics of post-industrial society. And, and we can say that this was the early stage of the discover of the internal areas of, of uh, uh, not only Italy, but also uh, France and uh, others um, countries. So it, it was a, a, a phenomenon that appears in Europe in the late 60s, coinciding with the French movement of May uh, 68. It was, let's say, a reverse emigration that displaces inhabitants from the cities to the countryside and the mountains, driven by a drastic rejection of the capitalist society. It's a kind of anti-modern and anti-urban inspirational uh, movement. So at the beginnings, and this is uh, in, in, in France, a French movement, at the beginnings, the protagonists of this movement were above all young people in search of an alternative model of life. So it was an ut utopian uh, movement and young people disappointed by the city and in need for uh, identity and community ties, community bonds. So uh, people who lived in the city on the edge of the system and who decided to settle in the countryside, often occupying abandoned farmhouses where they can start a new life, a new existence. So this is the sense. And the seven, um, uh, Les Seven, which was a, a mountain very similar to the Alpenine uh, because they were uh, isolated from the major cities uh, so far away from the industrial society uh, for the historical roots that characterized uh, Apennines, Italian Apennines and Les Cévennes in France uh, as a land of resistance in the Second World War. And also the low production capacity was the uh, similar factors. Uh, in Italy, the best known experience took place in a town in the Ligurian, Ligurian Apennines, the community of Ovada, uh, formed by the so-called hippies of Monte Colma. It was a short experience uh, of occupation of abandoned farmhouses and of a self-managed land cultivation, which involved about 100 young uh, people exponents of the counter, the so-called counterculture, coloring the hills of, Mont of Monferrato with various uh, forms of rebellion from sexual habits to music with psychedelic veins of um, pacifism, uh, counter information and nudism and, and so on. But to, to close my presentation, First of all, I would like to distance myself from this very popular position in the debate, <clears throat> which is a, a kind of nostalgic movements of ethnic revival or praise of the ruralist myth of anti-modern and, and anti-urban uh, inspiration. And I will also like to distance myself from retrotopic visions of happy degrowth which advocate impossible returns to a mythological past made, by, made, made up of small, uh, auto-sufficient uh, convivial societies and villages in harmony with the ecosystem. I don't think this is the, the solution. I think that we need to be very pragmatic. And we did this uh, general strategy for this uh, area, which is based mainly on the idea of establishing a network between the municipalities, as Luigi Fasciani already said, uh, <clears throat> establish a network to share services, to share economy production, uh, education, and so on. So, and we need right, to we improve. Have to and the, yeah, yes, this is the finishing uh, slide. Uh, improve the services for population and improve the uh, green economy which is based on the exploitment of agriculture and livestock 
and exploiting also of the forests for the production of timber and for realizing uh, district of new, new economy based on this territory. Thank you. Sorry for being late. No, thank you very much. Uh, we were ahead of time. Uh, to, uh, so we used it efficiently. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor, for your kind. Uh, You're welcome. If anyone wants to, to, uh, to talk to me, you can write me, of course, in my um, in my in the chat even here okay please uh, write it in the chat while i'm sharing the next speaker uh, so our next speaker is uh, professor giorgio vardiani from university of florence uh, uh, sorry and sorry Luai. we have to introduce the mayor of carapelle calvisio okay sorry for interruption yes sorry for that um, uh, Uzge, would you like to do that, please? So we have an uh, interruption in the schedule. We will uh, be back with the same program, but Uzge will introduce the mayor. So we will have so uh, Domenico Di Cesare, who is the mayor of Comune di Carapelle Calvisio, the, for his salutations. The floor is yours. Buongiorno, sono il sindaco di Carapelle Calvisio, di Cesare Domenico, come avete già detto. Porto il saluto dell'amministrazione e di tutta la comunità di Carapelle. Vi ringrazio per eh, la cortezza e la sensibilità che avete avuto sul nostro territorio. Questo è un territorio, diciamo, un unicum sul, sul territorio abruzzese di quattro eh, comuni che sono un stati... Secondo. Dobbiamo tradurre, quindi se facciamo una frase alla volta io posso tradurre. Va bene. Uh, so, thank you for inviting me in this uh, opening conference. I am the mayor of uh, Carapelle Calvisio, one of the municipalities in the area. Uh, eh, ecco, può andare avanti, ma facciamo una frase alla volta, se no io non riesco a tradurre. Sì, e Carapelle insieme agli altri comuni del territorio costituiscono un unicum sul territorio abruzzese. Uh, so Carapelle, together with the other uh, Castelvecchio, Calvisio, Castel del Monte, Calascio and, and others uh, are a, a unique uh, territory within the Abruzzo region. E sin dalla storia sono stati sempre uniti e sempre lo saranno, anche se non, eh, anche se non eh, legalmente, comunque siamo un territorio unito e delle stesse tradizioni e stesse eh, peculiarità. So, uh, from the very beginning, these territories have been united, they have common tradition and a common history. So even today, they are connected very strongly, even though there is no such, you know, there's no institution connecting them, but they are connected in terms of culture and history. Auguro a tutti i partecipanti un buon convegno e spero di avervi qui sul territorio spesso e, su, e presto. Buona so, giornata. Best wishes for the summer school, and I hope you will be able to be on our territory soon. Uh, grazie mille. C'è un gruppo di persone eh, sul territorio, e quindi magari possono programmare una visita da voi. Li aspettiamo, grazie. Thank you very much. Grazie mille. Okay, shall we go back to this program? Yes, indeed. Go ahead. Okay. So our next speaker is Professor Giorgio Verdiani from University of Florence. He's a researcher and professor at the Faculty of Architecture of Florence uh, with a degree, with a PhD degree in the survey and representation of architecture and environment, uh, architectural and landscape survey and representation. He specialized in digital survey using laser scanner technologies, photographical survey, image post-processing, and 3D computer graphic. Since 2009, he passed, he took care about the image post-processing uh, second, image post-processing and informatics activities courses at the junior degree uh, thesis course in the fashion design in Florence. 
Uh, Professor Verdiani also uh, took a fashion drawing course. He took the automatic design, CAD, and computer graphic course in the teaching model technical operator for cultural heritage at the University of Florence in 2004, 2005, and 2006. He has been a professor for a large number of courses in the subject area of the survey representation, uh, representation and in computer graphic, as well as for schools, municipalities, private structures. His professor for the design uh, drawing course at the Faculty of Civil Engineering at the e campus Online University. He's particularly active in the area of digital survey since 2001, taking part or managing as technical and scientific responsible of more than 100 of survey, survey campaigns all around Italy and Europe. Uh, today, he will present to us a title of From Cultural Heritage Documentation and Digital Survey to Multimedia. Professor uh, Verdiani, the stage is yours. Professor Verdiani, are you here? Okay, you're muted, I think, uh, Prof. You're still muted. Let me ask you to unmute. Do you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. But okay. I think on the other Perfect. computer, we can't, we can't. Okay, I am going to present from the computer and then on the screen on the I think the connection is a bit uh, weak. Uh, would you yeah, please uh, turn off maybe the camera? Maybe it would be better. This is the digital. This is the digital divide, Luai. And also, I was mentioning another... before the digital divide. Sorry, uh, would you repeat, please? This is another title. Giorgio, spengi la camera. Che la connessione è, è, non è buona. We couldn't hear. Maybe, uh, would you please go to the backstage, Professor Verdiani? So maybe we can, uh, we can. All right, uh, so Professor Verdiani will go to the backstage to solve the technical problem. Meanwhile, maybe we can go to the... Somebody else has to do the, go there as well. Who wants okay. to go? Ozge? Okay, I'm sending Ozge and Giorgio to the backstage. We can move on okay. to the next one. All right, let's okay. move on to the next speaker. So we have the next speaker is Professor Alessandro Camis from Erzin University. Um, Professor Alessandro has been graduated uh, with Bachelor of Architecture and Master of Architecture in Architecture, uh, in Architecture degree at Sapienza University in Rome, 1999. Before graduating, he cooperated with Sartugo Architetti Associated for the new Italian Embassy at Washington, D.C. and the Church of Jesus Holy Face, Rome. In 2007, he discussed his doctoral thesis on history of medieval town planning in Ravenna, Sapienza, and therein attended postdoctoral studies until 2014. He taught at the Rome program at the School of Architecture, University of Miami, and the Faculty of Architecture, Design, and Fine Arts of Girne, American University, Cyprus, where he directed until 2018 the International Center for Heritage Studies and Department of, at the Department of Interior Architecture. He's a member of ICOMOS Italy, Secretary General of Cyprus Network for Urban Morphology and Research, Director of Association for Historical Dialogue and Research in Cyprus. He's now Associate Professor and Director of the Laboratory of Dynamic Research on Urban Morphology, DRUM, at the Faculty of Architecture and Design of Özgün University in Istanbul. His main in research interests are in architectural design, urban morphology, and advanced technologies for conservative 
conservation and enhancement of architectural heritage. Uh, today, he'll be presenting to us post seismic reconstruction of new towns or almost where it was, how it was. Professor Kamis, the stage is yours, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and okay, we will talk about post seismic reconstruction and examining different options for this reconstruction, but also we will be considering the history of ancient seismic design. The cultural evolution of earthquake knowledge since ancient times reveals an interesting double track. On one hand, the religious culture, on the other hand, the scientific and material culture. The re religious culture of pagans, Jews, Christians, and Muslims interpreted um, the earthquake as a punishment for human sins. Actually, if you look at the existing literature about the history of seismic design, they all agree that the origin of this is 1755 after the great Lisbon earthquake and the understanding of earthquakes as a scientific geological understanding, 1850. But if we go into the ancient literature, we will find the, um, and this is common to the three religions, Christianity, uh, Jewish, uh, and Muslim, the example of Sonova and Gomorrah who were destroyed because of the sins but um, if we look at the literature, you know, it's, it's the punishment for the human sins. But on the other hand, if we look at the architecture, we're going to find something quite different, different. Examining the distribution of strong earthquakes, intensity above 10 from the 6th century to the 14th century, we will notice the concentration of these events in the uh, Mediterranean area. Uh, around the Italian peninsula, Greece, Anatolia. And if we examine the Eastern Mediterranean, we will see that the, uh, the strongest earthquakes in the past 1,500 years occurred in the area between Syria, Lebanon, and Turkey. So for 15 centuries, maybe even more, architects have been experimenting reconstruction after an earthquake. There are a number of examples of uh, ancient architecture that indeed uh, were designed so to handle horizontal accelerations. Uh, you see here some very um, interesting examples like the Hall of the Doric Pilasters in Hadrian's Villa, which is using steel elements connecting the lintel, just like the modern reinforced concrete the disposition of the bars is shown, or the Basilica uh, Ulpia in Rome, designed by Apollodoro de Damascus, holding metal pieces to connect the different elements of the uh, uh, structure, or Roman bridges, uh, and many other examples. So eventually, even though the scientific literature did not take uh, earthquakes into account, it seems like builders and designers did indeed um, consider horizontal acceleration within the design of their buildings. The um, progressive reduction of specific weights in the construction of the Colosseum, for example, which is built in two different materials, uh, travertine and gabine stone, or the Pantheon, they built in four different materials, reducing the horizontal acceleration, which goes to B, uh, uh, F equals MA. So the force is equal to the, the, the product of the mass for the acceleration. So lighter structure, less acceleration, less, less force in case of, of an earthquake. So it, see, it seems like architects indeed have been coping with these problems. Base isolation is very common. The obelisk of Theodosius still standing in Istanbul today even though it withstood a number of very intense earthquakes in the past um, 18 centuries, it was mounted on a double uh, shock absorbent uh, isolation system made of four cubes of bronze uh, between the obelisk itself and the 
marble base and four cubes of volcanic stone on the lower part. Uh, recent studies have shown how this uh, shock absorption method works indeed very well as a proof that the obelisk is still standing, whereas many other buildings uh, dating to that time collapsed for the uh, very strong earthquakes that happen in that time. Uh, but within the other examples, we can even earlier, the tomb of Cyrus, which is built with a shock absorption isolation system made of different layers of, uh, of ashlars with no mortar inside, uh, coupled with a, a core of sand or uh, traditional uh, uh, houses built in Iran, which are using uh, you, you see it in the picture, the isolation system made in timber. Or energy dissipating structures where <coughs> the wooden structure is able to move and the infilling is acting as a shock absorbing. So energy dissipating structures behave very well when there is an earthquake and the core, uh, horizontal acceleration but also symmetry since Roman times has been sorry I have to start sharing again symmetry was recognized even by Vitruvius as one of the features uh, for the buildings to withstand earthquakes they have noticed in the past that the symmetric buildings better withstand earthquakes because of the correspondence between the body center of the rigidity with the body center of the masses. This is from the guidelines for the uh, design of seismic resistant buildings in Umbria showing the principle. But the more axis of symmetry the building has, the more directions of horizontal acceleration it resists. So the central plan, which has been adopted by many different religions for sacred buildings is one of the most resistant structures. In the Middle Ages, we have a number of typical elements for uh, to resist acceleration, such as the buttresses, the uh, round circular openings on the facade to reduce the mass in those parts of the building and the apse itself. Even the different uh, openings on the bell towers uh, are meant to reduce the mass while the building is growing in height. Uh, the pointed arch is another interesting uh, example of how, in the past, designers dealt with horizontal iterations. We have many different flavors from Gothic to Islamic, um, uh, Moresque, and usually this is explained in, in those drawings so that the pointed arch is less pushing for, for horizontal forces, but the arch, in fact, is not a, a freestanding structure. It is part of a wall. So in a way, it has quite different behavior when inserted in a wall. In case of horizontal acceleration, a typical building with a horizontal acceleration given by the earthquake, that is the crack pattern that usually happens for the shear forces in the uh, walls be, uh, between windows. If one of those little triangles falls down like this, you have a pointed arch. And therefore, the pointed arch is basically a stable structure within the typical crack pattern of the wall when the arch is within the wall. Yet some people might say, this is quite theoretical. Is that really true? Well, let's see. This is an example, the municipality of Benzone before the 1976 earthquake. And this is the, 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 the configuration after the earthquake. You see the arch there, that is stable. So in case of reconstruction post earthquake, the pointed arch was found to be a more stable configuration. Within the other devices we found across history, we have what is called the juggle, juggled wasar lintel. You can spot this starting from the imperial times in, in Roman architecture. And I'm going to go quickly. Mausoleum of Theodoric has plenty of those within the arches and the lintels, uh, but also 
in the Middle Eastern area, in Sabrata or in Halabie, Praetorium, that's Syria. Um, and this technique of uh, juggle ashlars is then, you know, with continuity developed in the typical Islamic feature called ablak, which has many hundreds of examples in the Islamic architecture, starting from the 10th, 11th century, all the way to modern times. This is becomes a decorative feature, of course, with polychrome marbles, but it is indeed um, a feature to resist horizontal acceleration. The same kind of idea is then translated in, uh, in, in the West within Gothic architecture. You see here a very good example in the Prato Cathedral, where the dog of Wasor is even with a double um, dentature there, or in Venice, in the arch below one of the entrances of Ca Foscari, or even in the uh, Tribune Morte of Santa Maria del Fiore. Actually, those were built after Brunelleschi's death, but you can see in the decoration those stones uh, joined together with that typical. But also in ancient times, we have Peter Ligorio's treatise on the earthquakes that is dated 1570, way before the Lisbon earthquake. I would like to quote Peter Ligorio to know what they damage, what damage they cause is the pertinence of human rationality, the earthquakes. And defending oneself is a duty of the intellect. He also designed a seismic resistant house in Ferrara itself. It's still there. Now, after the earthquake, it is possible to rebuild. We are going to quickly examine some cases of the reconstruction after the earthquake, starting from the 1976 Friuli earthquake, and specifically the municipality of Vinzone, a medieval foundation since the 10th century with a very long history. And after the earthquake, so that's the location of it. You see it on the map. Luckily, hence the fear of communism uh, in the 1950s and 60s, an extensive aerial survey was done. So complete graphic documentation was available of all those cities. But uh, yes, in 1976, the earthquake with two different shakes uh, destroyed almost completely the city of Avenzone. Uh, and in that time, there was a very strong discussion in the, in the country about the reconstruction. Some people proposed the new towns, uh, just like recently in the Aquila case study. But a number of, a number of uh, intellectuals and the local population strongly opposed this idea and pushed strongly for the reconstruction dove era, come era, where it was and how it was. And uh, in fact, this was achieved with a law in regional law 1977 and the assignment to Gianfranco Canigia and Francesca Sartogo for a critical historical research for the reconstruction and restoration of the historical center of Benzone. The team of architects worked by cataloging all the building types in the city and all the fragments, all the uh, wood, uh, all the uh, stone fragments uh, were cataloged one by one and collected by the local population and then used for the reconstruction. Of course, the reconstruction updated the buildings. We're using in part the fragments and in part a new construction, whereas city walls, cathedral, and municipal palace and city gates were instead built exactly how they were where they were. The street network was considered to be a document and therefore reconstructed as it was where it was. Individual buildings maintain the property borders re were rebuilt using as much as possible the fragments, but with some up updating. So Vinzone is a very good example of reconstruction, very successful, not only in terms of physical reconstruction, but also uh, social reconstruction. Population is was happy after this event. Unfortunately, not the entire city of Benzone was reconstructed following Canigian and Sartogo uh, design, but the city is today standing and uh, 
a good, very good example, also quoted, mentioned very often in international literature about the reconstruction. The Belich earthquake instead is, uh, in, in, for some reason, an example of the opposite approach in reconstruction. After the earthquake, the city of Gibellina was uh, abandoned by following the policy of the government and the city was re reconstructed elsewhere, a new town. And a huge sculpture in reinforced concrete was built on top of the ruins of the city. Sorry for the very strong metaphor, but it is like your grandfather breaks a leg, so you bury him, cover him with reinforced concrete and apply for a clone. That is the same approach. Now, the new town of Gibellina is not as good as the old one. The old one is there like a monument of the dead city and the people are not happy. Uh, the Irpinia earthquake is another example. We're gonna look at Sant'Angelo dei Lombardi, but there are many other cities that were rebuilt following that earthquake in here. The strategy was based on the reconstruction as it was where it was for the monuments, castle, uh, churches, some churches, fortification, but the buildings, the houses were reconstructed with a little bit more free modern approach. Uh, this is the cathedral which was rebuilt in modern forms. In a way, the effect is not so bad for the monuments, but quite terrible for the urban tissue, which seems to be alienating. <laughs> Nevertheless, still the city was reconstructed where it was, not exactly how it was, um, which is much better than build, building it elsewhere. The Umbrian Marquisian earthquake has a huge number of good examples of reconstructions that we're not gonna examine, but the Cesaris has extensively studied them. We're not gonna examine them. And also the earthquake of L'Aquila, which damaged Castelvecchio as well, we are not gonna examine because the reconstruction is still ongoing. And maybe we're gonna have a lecture uh, by Varagnoli about this. And also the um, Emilia earthquake. Uh, we should have a lecture by Maietti about those reconstructions. But as a conclusion, we could say that when it comes to reconstruction of uh, earthquake damaged cities, we have different possible approaches. The reconstruction of monuments as, as they were, where they were, excusing the fragments. The reconstruction of the street network and public spaces as a collective value. The reconstruction of the facades of the buildings using, of the houses using the original fragments. The reconstruction, this is Benzonia, Canigia uh, application of the urban fabric within its own typological process including some kind of updating of the typological process. So not exactly how it was, but within the process starting from how it was into how it becomes today, but in the same place. Other strategies, the temporary construction in another site. Um, the Aquila earthquake has extensively adopted the idea of reconstructing somewhere else. And also the recent one in, um, in Marche, uh, the, the temporary and the definitive reconstruction in another site, such as Gibellina. And finally, the reconstruction of the landscape. Within the landscape, we have a number of visible, very important uh, elements of identity that sometimes can be reconstructed uh, as well. So my question for you for the summer school is how should we reconstruct Castelvecchio Calvisio? So you have two minutes left, uh, uh, Professor, if you have- I'm any. done, I am done. Okay. So thank you very much, Prof. Um, we will move to the next speaker. Uh, we will uh, take the Professor, Professor Giorgia, Giorgia, Giorgio Verdiani, are you here? Is confirmed. And yeah. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so uh, we already introduced you uh, before. But let me give yes. uh, just a brief one. Uh, Professor Verdiani is responsible of survey, of digital survey uh, at the, uh, the University of Florence. And uh, he will be giving a lecture to us about a scenario of the tools for digital survey from digitalization to multimedia. Stage is yours, Professor. 
So, uh, good morning, everybody. And I go sharing my screen and just to avoid the previous issues, uh, we are not going to use the webcam. So, let's start from the beginning. Would you make it full screen, please? Uh, this presentation. And uh, obviously, we are here in a Sorry. Okay. okay. Do you see the screen correctly? It's coming. It's loading. So it must be. Yes, it's okay. it's here. Ben. Please go ahead. Ah. Okay. It's okay. Perfect. Uh, so, well. Uh, here we are for the second time in the Fundation Calvisio. And just a short premise about the digital survey in general. We are going to use it to create a correct base and a set of digital data to help the knowledge about the place and to help reconstruction and presentation is extremely interesting because as you heard from the creation of the graphic elements that were the feeling of the reality uh, toward issues of, uh, and uh, solution to enriching this element with information and metadata and version of it. So the creation, the invention of the digital twin is We lost, we lost him again. I think he has some connection problems. So, um, sorry, but uh, let's try again. Now you hear me? Okay. Yes, but uh, the connection is uh, is very bad. Uh, uh, we got we yeah, one of the reasons why no one uh, live here probably. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay. Can we try again okay. sharing your screen? A lot of people may say a lot of nice things about reconstruction and going back in places. There are no, no uh, reason for coming back, like uh, no connection or issues about connection, probably. They stay at home. So now are uh, it's working now. Oh, it's okay, perfect. So going back to the- We can't uh, see your screen now. Uh... Let's Maybe try. try again. I have to share again, probably. Yes, please. I'm going to do it right now. Okay, I think when you share your screen, the connection goes uh, bad. So. Okay. We try. Okay. Now it's working. Let's try that window. Now we are just checking the various windows to see which window is going to work better for the connection. Let's see if it works now. Yes, it works. Yes. Now, okay. But when I change the slide, I see that there is no change in the slide. No. Oh, there is just a large delay in the slides, but oh well. Uh, let's go. Uh, so going back to my presentation, let me say that right now we have the possibility to have a digital clone of the reality to manage it and to make and build our ideas and control the reality. All is done using digital geometries that uh, all the users, all the people involved in uh, these uh, uh, tasks uh, needed to know and to have clear because we move most of the time from a digital model made by point cloud towards 
models that are in the end drawing or representation of the reality by surfaces uh, uh, based on polygonal, polygonal or NURBS modeling. And um, this is a, a very basic argument, but uh, sometimes ignored by a lot of uh, people using the digital graphic even at a good level. But in the end, most of the issues and troubles come from this. But we have an entity that is the basic start of everything, which is the point cloud that a photogrammetric or lasergrammetry survey may produce easily, and is a geometrical entity that show us the reality made by points uh, gathered at a certain density with a certain value of color or grayscale that represent the 3D complete model of uh, what we have just surveyed. We, here we see a portion from a past survey in the Kyrenia uh, castle in North Cyprus. And here we know that, for example, this kind of data can be used to create a, a section, to create a representation of the reality and bring them toward a, a representation that is more classical, more similar to what we are used to uh, to have as a representation for architecture or for uh, engineering purposes. Uh, we have to keep in mind that these dense clouds have um, other values that are more than simple x, y, and z uh, coordinates that came from the polar coordinates gathered by a laser scanner system or the direct x, y, and z gathered by a photogrammetric system and have an RGB value that most of the time in a laser scan is a reflectance value and maybe a color value can be calculated by a photogrammetry process. And we can create a section, we can extract lines that for an architect make sense representing correctly the uh, building, the uh, elements uh, that uh, we want to know, like the, the, the uh, thickness of a wall or uh, of, a, um, of a floor or other uh, information that are very, very fundamental to read architecture. Obviously, we have to, uh, we need a clear idea about the survey tools. And it, it, nowadays is very interesting because most of them are little by little becoming more popular and have a popularization that makes the, them affordable for the most of us. For example, we know well, the idea at uh, the base of the laser scanner units, which uh, use a uh, laser beam uh, signal to gather a measurement. And the mass, more and more massive data gathering from this kind of uh, tools make them perfect to gather large urban area or uh, as well as a small building or interiors. And this uh, uh, variety of uh, uh, tasks uh, included in the same uh, machine all of us to gather a whole town or a large building in uh, the span of uh, some days uh, or some weeks according to uh, the planning of our survey campaign. Uh, right now, most of the, these tools uh, use the phase shift technology to measure the distance, which is a, a sort of magic because they measure the variation in the uh, wave uh, of the laser light beam and uh, they measure the distance and then measure the angles and put the point in space. And this is done for uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of times in a second. So we gather in real time all, all that's, uh, that's around the scanner when it works, obviously. And uh, uh, the other tools that uh, create a very significant renewal in the digital survey techniques is photogrammetry, because photogrammetry from being a very complex and expensive processing became extremely affordable by anyone. You can create a good photogrammetry even from a mobile phone, but when you use a professional tools, you get an extremely good result with a lot of details, millimetric size of the pixel and so on. And right now, the um, option for using photogrammetry from a drone, from a flying camera, uh, all of us to get a whole survey done in uh, really minutes 
and create a, 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 an extremely uh, um, trustable coverage of roofs of elements that are out of range for any other kind of a survey, even for a laser scanner unit, it may be extremely uh, complex and difficult to gather the roofs from a small town or from a large building. Instead, in this way, flying around makes possible to create a, a complete coverage of everything like we are doing here in Castelvecchio Calvisio. And it is possible to mix this data together with the laser scanner data and with photogrammetry taken from the, from the floor. This renewal is based on uh, multimedia needs. Uh, it started at the end of the first 2000 and is based on some algorithm, namely the structure from motion, image motion matching uh, processing that makes possible to recre recreate the positioning of the camera, project the pixel, create the 3D models, and then create a, a completely textured digital model of, out of the pictures. Obviously the strategies are different because we have to keep in mind that when we are going to use a laser scanner unit, we are extremely sure about the level of details that we are going to gather because we know that the instrument has a certain accuracy and it produces a well, we may say, consolidated result that exactly go toward a perfect documentation of the wall building. Instead, with the photogrammetry, we will be not uh, really completely sure about the result until we process completely the photogrammetry. And this may, may take some days in certain situations. So it's more a strategy based on the skills and competencies of who is working, who is taking the picture, then uh, giving all the, um, all the trust to the machine that is uh, taking the survey. Uh, and one extremely interesting aspect is that uh, gradual popularization of this process because uh, the price is uh, um, lower uh, little by little, but now are extremely interesting for a lot of tools. This makes uh, these tools affordable by most of the people. And especially for the photogrammetry, it is possible to have it included inside tools like uh, smartphones, like it is for the recent iPhone version that includes the so-called LiDAR um, module that allow to create uh, 3D models that uh, most of the time are quite poor, but if I use it correctly with the correct tools in, the, in terms of software and apps, allow to create nice models from uh, small objects and small spaces. And obviously, it's pos it is possible to face uh, photogrammetry using cheap cameras because it is enough to have a low price second hand digital camera and you have enough for your digital experience in uh, photogrammetry to start it and then understand what you need in more to increase the quality of the result. And then we show also not for a spot, but just because it is the cheaper and more uh, lightweight scanner around, which is the VLK 360, uh, like a Joe system uh, scanner that is just one kilo. So we may say that like right now, we find it the price of, of, of the scanner in kilos. So one kilo of scanner is uh, affordable for a small studio, for someone that work in a small, uh, digital survey and so on, but is extremely uh, versatile and it may allow as, um, to complete a larger uh, intervention and to uh, integrate well any kind of digital survey for anyone. But going back to the main uh, subject, right now there is a lot of talking and there is a, a lot of interest about the, how to pass this kind of data toward the BIM models. So BIM supporting the model uh, modeling of architecture, the control, the digital tools we need for having digital twins that works fine for the uh, managing and the restoration or um, in general, the uh, lifelong um, control of a building. And this is done at right now with the, extremely strong simplification of the models. Little by little, it will be 
goes on, we, we go on creating more compliant uh, solution with uh, uh, traditional architecture with the built heritage and so on. Right now, we still need a strong simplification, but little by little, the tools are increasing their uh, capacity of uh, data treatment. They allow us to include more information like metadata, picture, pictures and drawings connected uh, to the uh, point cloud. So it is possible to pass to others uh, a larger set of information that are not only metrical, geometrical, and um, in a certain way, colored version of the real, but we can add the metadata, the extra information, uh, records that allow other people to better understand the state of their architecture and move them to other kind of representation. And uh, obviously, uh, shortly, because we have presented this just yesterday, in the past year, this was applied in the case of Castelvecchio Calvisio. And it was about uh, operating in a short time to give to the people uh, in, a, in the turn of a few days a digital model of all the interior coverage and fronts of the uh, downtown, of the main uh, center of the, the town. And this was done using a laser scanner unit and a drone that allowed to co create this digital twin of the whole town. This was, this was possible in just a few days with an extremely uh, fast uh, treatment of the data. And this, I think, is something to think about because it shows us that it's possible to have a digital base on which operate uh, quickly. So it works for uh, a workshop or a summer school, it may work even better for emergency intervention after disaster and so on. So it needed to be better included in the process of this kind of situation. And obviously we have the uh, result from the laser scanner that are based on this large number of scans taken in the turn of uh, um, just three days and cover all the streets and fronts in the town center. So, in, the, uh, in this year, the intention is to continue and complete the exterior turn and integrate some interiors. Just today, we didn't start well because of the weather and because of some issues from the laser scanner unit, but we hope to get the thing solved uh, quickly and uh, bring on the, the task we are planning. And uh, we, here we see some images that are based on the grayscale um, rendering of the uh, view from the point cloud to show you the level of details reached in uh, this uh, fast and intense work in the past year. And uh, it is possible, as you can see, to notice all the details of, from the masonry, the state of decay, the elements, the main architectural elements, but also the details from the uh, plan, uh, from the plans, uh, the wires, uh, the element of um, integrated by the and modified by the inhabitants, as well as to have sections and to have extract that show the fronts, the develop the uh, path of the uh, main section across the streets and to have all the level well managed and perfectly measured, which means that you can uh, plan, design elements. So I think that the fact that we have yeah, right now in sharing on the Google Drive for the World Summer School, uh, the data from the past year is a good point to start from all the people involved in this, in this summer school, both for the group in the digital survey team, but also for the people in the design teams, because they can see and draw and understand well the subject of their study. So moving to the end of this work, uh, just a few notes about uh, the uh, data available for the World Summer School. You just have to enter the, uh, the shared Google Drive that is a uh, unlimited, unlimited in Spain space uh, in storage in terms of data. And so you just have to enter the 
uh, through the folder maybe the 2020, and there you find it divided in, uh, in the other folders, the 3D laser scanner uh, data, the drone data, and a uh, collection of snapshots. And uh, consider that uh, to get the whole uh, point cloud, you needed to download all the 23 RAR files, which are four gigabyte each. So uh, try to have a good connection, download everything in, uh, on a disk with uh, a lot of free storage because then you will have to extract them. And then you have Castelvecchio Calvisio in your hands in a certain way. And uh, to access this data, you can use it directly Autodesk AutoCAD, but you can uh, even consider to install Recap Pro, which is uh, obviously a commercial software, but is available for students for academic use at no at a free for free, and uh, it has a one one year of license most of the time. So you just have to log in into the Autodesk Academic account, uh, create a, a, um, a student account, and then you can download the software for free and you start using it. But if you just have AutoCAD, it's not a problem. You can open the point cloud using the uh, insert function. You can insert the point cloud in the uh, space of AutoCAD. You don't need a, a super workstation to do it. It's enough um, reasonable um, notebook. And because uh, the data is true, that is about 130 gigabyte of uh, uh, data set, but it will be loaded little by little. Not uh, you don't need it to be loaded fully in memory. You just have to be a little patience, patience uh, with it, and uh, with calm, you will get your section, your data, and so on. And in case of need, just ask because we are obviously here for that. So. That's all, and uh, uh, thank you for your attention. And any questions are uh, welcome. Thank you very much, Professor Gianni. We will be uh, back with questions and answers at the end of the sessions because we're running out of the time. <laughs> Let's go to the next speaker. Um, it's a colleague. She's a colleague of mine uh, at the University of Ozin uh, University, Ejam Boyaji. Uh, she is graduated in architecture at Ozin University. Uh, from in Istanbul uh, in 2020. She attended workshop of digital survey and religious buildings in 2018 and in the international urban design workshop of urban facade Istanbul waterfront in 2019 as a part of the survey team. She is currently attending the master of science program in architecture at Erzin University. Her research interests include urban morphology, space syntax, history of architecture and cultural landscape. Uh, hey, Luai, I think you skipped those again. No, we changed the program. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Oh. Okay, uh, Ijam, the stage is yours. Please unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay. Please. Thank you for uh, uh, for the lovely presentation, uh, Luai. For me, today I'm going to talk about... Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to talk about uh, girl yazı, but I can't make the... Would you please make the full screen? Would yes, you... I'm trying to do that. Is it okay now? Yes, it's... it's okay. Fine. Today I'm going to talk about the morphology of the podium house for the multilayered layered history of Apollonia Adrindacum, otherwise known as girl yazı. It is located in uh, Bursa. Uh, 35 kilometers far away from the city center of Bursa. And it's located, it's a small village located on the development axis of the Bursa, Turkey. The settlement is mostly located on island and it is connected to peninsula by a bridge. So we are talking about an island uh, and, uh, and the peninsula and it's connected by a bridge. And there are a lot of traditional timber framed Ottoman houses in the settlement part, which is located on the uh, island part of Gölyaza, mostly on the island par part of Gölyaza. It's uh, Gölyaza's daily social life cycle, its physical relationships, local activities and production have specific rhythms depending on natural characteristics 
and the cycle of Ulubat Lake. So Ulubat Lake is very important, uh, and its connection to the mainland to Gerlaza is very important in this settlement in this village. And for example, I can show you in this bottom photos that the Ulubat Lake's water levels changing through seasons. And when it's high, you can see that uh, it comes all the way up to the bridge. And when they go, when it follows, it leaves its remarks. So with this changing water levels and the uh, lake is creating economical and transportational uh, possibilities for the settlement, it's very important for Gerliza. This uh, village has a rich sociocultural background, and this creates a multi-layer cultural landscape, which we can observe today with our, with our eyes. We, if we go there, we can see this multi-layered structure. We can see the um, remainings of the anti-period, the Ottoman period, and they all come together. They are all built on top of each other, which is very fascinating. Its name Apollonia ad Rindakos, which means uh, Apollonia located on the shore of Rindakos, uh, comes from the, to locate the, this village on the shore of Rindakos because there were a lot of Apollonias around this region back in uh, antique period. And also Apollo, Apollon was the guiding god of the city. So uh, because of that, the name was Apollon and this was Apollon uh, located on the shore of Rindakos. These are some uh, important informations for us to understand Gölyaza. For the history of the city, we know that it has gone through ancient, medieval, Ottoman, and Turkish Republican period and come today. The most important uh, time periods that we will be examining are the ancient, uh, ancient period uh, and the Ottoman period, because uh, the remains of ancient periods are still visible, where we can see some like city walls and the Ottoman in, during the Ottoman period the houses built on the top of these remains are still uh, located in the island part settlement today. The important uh, things the pre-Hellenistic periods that we are we have small information not much information about these times but uh, about Roman and Ottoman periods uh, we can talk more about uh, what we have in the, what happened in these times. And for the example of this, we, we can see some uh, photos and drawings from Ottoman periods in here, which shows us, uh, I'm sorry, which shows us the shore culture of Gölyazı. I mean, the, we can see the ships because this uh, Gölyazı was a very important port city back in those days, even in ancient times. Uh, and we can see in the draws and during the Ottoman period, we can see the ships, we can see that the, trees inside the water which shows that the water levels also were changing and the houses the settlement and how people are using the shore and we also know during the roman times there was a uh, prosperity after the first century after christ uh, and there was a lot of construction activities uh, during first century and also when the roman empire fall uh, the construction in city walls also increased. So during Roman times, these construction activities uh, had increased and the earthquake in these times also uh, affected this uh, construction increases. And after the population exchange in 1922, the Christian population left uh, the girls and today, mostly it's Muslim population and it doesn't have the cultural diversity that it used to have, but it's still a small village, uh, fishing village that uh, still has the, its economy based on fishing and transportation on lake. And, and on top of that also tourism based because of its location on the development axis. Uh, we can see here two maps that, that are from uh, the visitors of from 1842 and 1910. There are some important parts that I want to mention. You can see the Maiden Island, which has, which is believed to have the Apollon Temple, the Guardian of the City's temple on top of it. And uh, we today, with some archeological excavations, we have found the remains uh, of this temple. And back in the day, we can see the, how it was drawn in the traveler's map. And we can also see the ancient road 
which was the only connection the islands had with the mainland and was used a lot during the ancient times. And we have we can see the typological qualities and the city walls, how the city walls were determined. How, uh, it was called like a castle. It was very strong and how we can see that they are depicted during this uh, drawings. And for this uh, research after the literature review and these historical maps, and archaeological evidences, architectural drawings and site visits took place. And after that, we made uh, them come together. And uh, during this research, we realized the importance of water from because of its connection with the lake and the settlement. Uh, we wanted to turn our focus to this part. And the city walls and the traditional Ottoman houses on top of the city walls became the focal point of this research as the different layers of multi-layered structure. We picked five Ottoman houses on waterfront and then focused on one very interesting example, the podium house, to see, understand the history, the morphology of uh, Gölyazı and understand uh, its unique tissue. First, uh, I can start with the Poland temple, which is uh, uh, located on the main island. As I said, it is look, looking towards the settlement, like it's guarding and looking at uh, the city, and it's it during the excavations, its semicircled entrances was uh, the uh, stairs on the semicircle entrance was found, and the Temenos walls around the island were discovered, and it seems like this island was totally left for the uh, Apollon Temple as, as a sacred uh, area, and also there was a storing found in, the, in this area, which is a uh, link that the ships that were coming towards the island tie themselves up uh, when they reach that part. Uh, and so we can say that the, it also shows that there was an important building in here but, uh, because during when ships, ships are coming close, they use uh, that kind of buildings for triangulations uh, and realize uh, the settlements. And also, it can it's it might be connected with the port function. And other than that, uh, there were some columns found inside the lake, uh, right near the island, which might be inter uh, interpreted as because of the changing water levels. Some parts uh, might be uh, now inside the lake too. So it needs more focus, uh, but uh, because of the vegetation on the island. Now the further research could not be took place for further excavations. And there you can see some points uh, from Roman times. And uh, that in Maximinus area, they were found in the Gölyaz and they represent an Apollon temple. This was a uh, common Apollon temple representation on coins. And you can see a Tetra style uh, temple and Apollon in the middle of it. But in Lebas's drawings, who visited uh, Gölyazı in 1888 and gives us the most, uh, the most important evidences for this uh, area, the Apollon temple, shows us a hexa style temple. It might be uh, these differences uh, shows that maybe Lebas's drawing can be problematic, maybe wrong, but also. This means these coins might be depicting another temple in settlement uh, or in Gölyazı. Another important parts are ancient roads and necropolis, theater and stadium. Uh, for theater and stadium, we don't know, uh, we don't have much evidences left. They are mostly destroyed. But the necropolis, who is, uh, which is located two sides of the uh, ancient road, the important part is that there was. Uh, uh, Mausoleums and graves found uh, with podium structures located uh, on this part of the road and looking towards the, uh, the Apollon Temple. Uh, and all of these uh, graves were, that were found was were belonged to Roman times, and they were uh, some of them were bigger, and they some of them had podium structures and some big and important uh, graves looking towards the Apollon temple. Now for, uh, for the first layer, we examined the city walls. 
And you can see in here, now this is the island part of Kölyazım. And you, when you enter here, this is the first gate. And then there is another gate uh, on the 150 meters later than the first gate. And you can see the uh, city walls are also, uh, there are some possible city walls. I mean, these are the ones we can observe and these are the possibilities that where they were in the ancient times. And uh, you can, there are different materials in the city walls because the construction enforced different times. It's not just, uh, it didn't build in one time, but there are some spoiler materials, for example, that were used in theater and stadium. And then later from there, when it was needed, for example, like when the um, uh, Roman Empire fell down, they needed more uh, city walls and they used materials from the theater and stadium uh, in these city walls. And there are some marble and limestone blocks which dates the city walls back to Hellenistic times. And it, and it is very important. It shows that we had them in uh, Hellenistic times too, but the rubble stone and plaster mixing uh, materials uh, are more determining uh, these walls for the late antique period. And also another important structure, this number seven, is that one of the stone rings that was found in the Apollon temple was also discovered in this site too. And it's located in number seven, and you can see it here, the story that I was talking about. And the podium house, the podium, Roman podium structure that we will be examining is located near the stone ring. And this, in this side of the island, we can see that there are a lot of castles. Castles are located in, around this. And if we look at, uh, if we look at this uh, organic st st structure of Kyolyaz in here, we can say that these sites might be used as uh, defense purposes, gathering purposes, or open areas. But in like uh, antique times too, because the grid structure we can observe on this side of the uh, island, we cannot see it in uh, the part that the castles were gathered. But uh, we might, we can also mention that this site was also the main local point of daily life. The open areas was there in Ottoman times too. This also supports this idea too. In, there was a school building and a church, the uh, uh, church, then a school building in here, then the mosque and primary school located in this site during the Ottoman period. <clears throat> and we can observe here the great structure and then the organ structure in different parts of the map. Uh, also, we can see that the waterfront houses are following the shape of the city walls and they are built on top of these city walls. To uh, examine Gölyazı, we wanted to focus on these houses which follow the shape of the city walls and are on the part of the grid structure. So we can, uh, we can find the part that dated, we can date back to antique times and we can see its connection with Ottoman times. Then we picked five houses based on the available data we had. Uh, and in some of these houses, we wanted to see its typology, how uh, understand how these Ottoman houses. And we have realized something. Uh, first, they all had side entrances because the uh, changing water levels was making it impossible to enter houses from lake side, lake side. So they all have entrances, not on this lake side, but on their sides. They have mostly uh, small backyards and they are courtyard houses. And we can see it in here, uh, they're like attached houses with small backyards, but we can see it in here uh, as we look at it generally, uh, the houses had bigger gardens and bigger parcels and uh, more detached houses. And in these ones, we have big storage units because the production and the fishing activities in Gölyaz was also carried on inside the houses too. And the L-shaped sofa turned into a corner-shaped sofa on the first or the second floor. Most of the houses are in this uh, area in Gölyaz are consist of ground floor and then first or second floor, as well as our uh, examples in here. The ground floor has the service functions and as the first and second floor has more daily functions, uh, live, 
livable functions uh, on these floors. And we can Sorry, see that. Uh, you have uh, two minutes left. Yes, okay, I'm I'm going uh, a little Thank bit you. faster. So uh, you can see in here that another important thing is that the photomass that I will show in more detail is looking towards the Maiden Island. Uh, it's one of the houses that we examined before. And it's looking towards the Apollon Temple, as well as the Apollon Temple is looking towards the settlement. And you, as you remember, Tom's were looking at the um, Apollon Temple too. This is important because it's going to help us to understand, think about its function when we examine the podium house. And also another important thing is there, there is the storing that we saw in the Apollon Temples too, because this might indicate that this podium house might have an important function, just like the temple had. And as the tombs were looking at the temple, we can say that the, the way that the uh, Apollon, uh, the way that the podium is looking towards this island and the temple might indicate that there was a, a tomb, an important, another temple or a mausoleum or a tomb uh, in this area too. Uh, this is the podium house, but uh, as we have seen the plan drawings, this is not much different. It shows the same qualities in here. It's just a little bit bigger and more complex complex uh, plan in the ground floor. But I want to show you this, that when we look at the podium house, we see three different layers. First layer is the Roman podium. podium it's dated back to the first century after Christ. Uh, and then the second and third uh, layers are called Ottoman houses, but we can see the different uh, construction techniques and different materials in number two and three. This might indicate that uh, these but might be uh, constructed in different times or by the different uh, constructors. But the important part, we want to focus here the podium. Uh, and you can see the co these cornices, and these, the, these cornices are only located in podium, uh, this Roman podium. Uh, and the other parts of city walls are not, does not have this. And this podium was first uh, constructed as a podium of a structure, but then used as the city wall. And these uh, cornices are what makes this very special because it shows us that there was something important, there was something different in here. And uh, in the C part, we see the big angled uh, marble blocks. And you can see some hitching points in here, which shows that this block we had, the hitching points, was removed from somewhere and used uh, in the construction of podium later uh, during these times. We can say we can see that uh, it had a story nearby, and it was different, and it was uh, looking towards the Poland Temple. There is a possibility that this was an important and different structure. And we can see that, and uh, also there was like uh, step-like structures on the low, lower parts uh, of this podium, and we can understand the podium structure when we look at, take a closer look. Uh, and we can, when we examine Sorry, the that, informations, uh, we can, okay, we can, can see the, uh, we can think about its uh, functions. And actually, uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, we can say that Gorlias is a historically rich cultural site, which is gaining more attention by researchers day by day because of its multiple structure. Uh, but the studies amongst, uh, mostly focused on peninsula part, so we wanted to take a look at the other part, uh, the other part of Gyorgyza. And since Ulaabat and Gyorgyza has significant relationship, we focus on the waterfront. Uh, most of the, we choose the houses and as a layer, and the city walls as another layer. And we most of the houses are located on the city walls, and they represent the transformation process of Gyorgyza. So we try to understand its process. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, Thank you very so. much, Ejam, for your presentation and uh, for uh, your patience because there's no time. That's why I was interrupting. So. Oh, of course, this is not a problem. Okay, so our next speaker is another colleague of mine, is uh, Uzge Uzlovanshi from Ozin University. 
she is graduated in ar uh, from architecture at Gibbsay Technical University and holds a master's degree in architecture uh, design from Istanbul Technical University um, uh, from in 2019. She is currently a PhD candidate in the architectural program of Erzin University in Istanbul. And since 2017, uh, she has been uh, assigned as a research assistant in the same university. She is a member of the Dynamic Research on Urban Morphology Laboratory uh, at Erzin University. Uh, she would be presenting with to us uh, a title of post seismic typological transformation of three medieval houses in Castelvecchio Calvizio AQ, uh, with participation of Julia Bertola from Politecnico di Torino, and uh, with participation of Professor Alessandro Camis from Erzin University. Uzge, the stage is yours. Welcome. Hello again. Uh, thank you, Lai, for the kind introduction. This presentation is about a project proposal for typological transformation of three medieval houses in Castelvecchio Calvisio, which was intensively damaged in the L'Aquila earthquake. Okay. For anyone interested in it, we will also explain the process in written format in the proceedings of AACCP conference that take place in this year. And these projects, project proposals were developed during the online ESAR Borga Brussels Summer School organized last year in July. The design brief given to students was analyzing the area to establish design guidelines for the resurrection of the town and developing design proposals for an anti seismic house design in the urban core. Since it was an online summer school, each team had a Google Meet room and a Jamboard dedicated to an important figure, which was Gianfranco Canigia for the team of three tutors, me, Julia Bartola, and Alessandro Camis, and six students, which are Elif Gökbulut, Maria Petrovic, Aslı Kankat, Cemre Uslu, Ece Alkan, and Lee Kimpang. So the students were firstly informed about the multiscolar design methodology proposed by Canigia Maffei and Cesare Brandi's principles of restoration. The project had to be reversible, compatible, recognizable, and done with minimum intervention while aiming an imagery integration. First, the students looked at the territorial scale. Castelvecchio Calvisio is in the province of L'Aquila in the Abruzzo region, and it is the part of series of six small towns of outlined here. We aim to build a cultural district with the idea of building a network of municipalities. The District de Culturale Baronia di Carpella, and it, now it has an active Facebook group, which Professor Camus indicated before. Also, we worked on designing a logo for this cultural district with six dots to represent each settlement with the perimeter to inscribe the identity of this place. And these were the proposal, and we have the final result. In the workshop, we studied the territorial organism, the ridges, cross ridges, body rows for understanding the formation of urban tissue to find the gates and the main rows here. And after those analyses, we illustrated our position estimations on the places described in text to online, outline the medieval landscape. Here. You can see it on the plan on the right. And compare different hilltop towns to, that have a similar morphology to understand the relation between the center and the perimeter. Since our aim, the aim of our practice is to revitalizing the settlement by providing houses, the seismic risk analysis gave us an idea about why, why some of the houses are still in good condition, some other houses are heavily damaged. The buildings which are heavily damaged usually have a bridge in between the, while the blocks that survived the earthquake in good condition have almost no br hanging bridges connections on the second floor, they have a continuity of walls and similarity in height. So thanks to Giorgio Verdiani and his team from University of Florence, we have the digital model of the medieval town. It gave us the information of facades, especially the floor levels and entrances, because the slope of the terrain is very challenging. And also for gaining information about the interior space of houses, we benefited from the survey plan provided by the municipality that show walls, staircases, and openings. We have multiple floor plans to understand that complicated organism because each house is like a labyrinth in the inside. So as the first step of design process, we wanted to identify the transformation process of the houses and based our research on typomorphological approach developed by Canigian Mafia after their intensive studies on Italian cities. 
and our estimation on transformation process of these houses starts with an identification of the original monocellular cellular house base type with a narrow ambitus to drain the water. That type is still visible on the west of the settlement. Next, the ambitus disappears, then the narrow staircases outside take shape for reaching to upper floors. The openings between two cells on both floors indicated the fourth step of B cellular row house with two floors, and the interior staircases pointed us the uh, progress into a multicellular inline house with even maybe three floors. And to implement our design idea, we selected three areas that are missing their walls or roof because of those missing parts that might be dangerous for future seismic activity. So the first example is house A, where we merged two episode row houses with an ambitus in between into a new row house. In here, one of the mouse houses were missing the roof of the second floor, and it was very suitable for the transformation. Here you can see the current elevations. And we decided to keep the masonry wall as it is, then added wood, wooden slabs and this designed the roof according to the window positions to unify the interior levels. And what you see with red in this animation is showing the new additions. And the next example is proposing to merge six pseudo row houses into an inline house. The first step was to remove the ambitus for going to the second stage of this transformation process. Then we unified the floor heights and the pseudo row house on the right side was in a different height regarding the slope of the terrain. So this part is to a third floor. And you can see the plans and the Elevation is still almost the same, but with very small changes. And the house C was in the edge of the city, and the house on the higher ground had lesser floor levels than the others. So you can see in here. And the standing wall in here was indicating a demolition of that floor happened before. So we decided to transform these four and a half episode row houses into an inline house and we unified the floor levels and the roof. And the small row house is in here takes part as the staircase for two apartment building. Uh, sorry. Two flat apartments in every floor. You can see the entrance here. And on the upper part, we have one apartment on the right and one apartment on the left. And here we have the updated facade and the entrance floor. The section shows the height of the roof was designed accordingly. And on the left, we see the updated facade with new openings based on the previous uh, situation. So according to our estimations on the cost of the first proposal, the house A, it would take 1,000 euro per square meter, which makes 132,000 euros for a row house with 122 square meters, not including the cost of the existing house. The cost estimations were done according to prices from the local providers. So in conclusion, we see that a typological and technological update is necessary in order to make it feasible. And fortunately, it is economically convenient to restore the existing houses inside the walled core of Castelletio Calvicio. Even though this proposal is good for educational purposes, it might not be a good solution because of possible ownership issues. And doing such an update in the block scale would be a better option, both for ownership uh, and seismic resistance. And this summer, we are aiming to develop proposals in the block scale. And here are our references. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Eske. Um, we have uh, 10 minutes. If anyone would like to make any quick remarks before we go on, please do so. If not, we can go up with the other speakers.
So our next speaker is uh, Professor Sermin Şakıcı Alp from Hacettepe University. Uh, she have been completed her undergraduate education in the Faculty of Architecture. Uh, Dr. S uh, Sermin Çakıcı Alp was educated in the master's and PhD programs in conservation of cultural heritage in the Faculty of Architecture at Middle East Technical University in Turkey. She also visited the School of Architectural Planning and Landscape Design at Newcastle University in the UK in between 2013 and 2014 as a fellow researcher with the financial support of uh, a Middle East Technical University faculty training program and Bursa Metropolitan Municipality Scholarship Funds. Meanwhile, she has followed the studies in conservation management projects for historical towns such as York and uh, Greenger town in Northeast England under the supervision of Professor Dr. Uh, John Bundlebury as the contact faculty. The fields of interest in her academic career are named as architectural design, preservation, rehabilitation of historical sites, theory in reconstruction and conservation historic monuments, transformation and regeneration of historical neighborhoods, urban history studies of Ottoman cities. Um, after having academic experience in different national universities in Turkey, she is currently working as assistant professor in the Faculty of Architecture in Hacettepe University in Ankara, the capital of Turkey. She is going to present to us today an interesting topic about advanced digital technologies for the rehabilitation of an Ottoman caravansaray in Bursa. Uh, Professor Sermin, are you here? Okay, I think we couldn't, we can't hear you. Could you please? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Perfect. Okay, if there's a problem, I think, with my microphone, so I uh, thought of it. Uh, I want to uh, okay. close the uh, screen uh, to my video uh, because uh, okay. sometimes yes. the internet connection can be weak because of that. Uh, thanks uh, right. a lot. Uh, thanks a lot to, first of all, uh, Professor Kamis and uh, the other, all the members uh, that uh, invite invitation, this kind of invitation uh, for this conference meeting. And uh, this is a very uh, exciting and significant to practice on revival of urban heritage. I want to share, I tried to share, but it didn't. I don't know why. Is it okay now? Can you see the presentation? Yes. Yes, we can see this, the presentation. Maybe you can but, go uh, you should see. <laughs> uh, if you, Sorry for that. Perfect, yes, we can. Ah, okay, then. Uh, I try to present you the contribution of advanced digital technologies in rehabilitation of an urban heritage site within historic city center of Pursa. Uh, maybe you know now, but uh, the Ejam, I think, uh, explained uh, about Pursa a little bit, but Gölyazi is a village of Pursa, so uh, here uh, we can uh, give information about, I try to information about the historic city center of Pursa. Uh, you know, Bursa is the first capital of Ottoman Empire, and it is not a depopulated town, is uh, the, within the concept of summer school. Uh, but uh, I try to define uh, there are lots of abundant uh, urban heritage sites in a uh, historic commercial center of Bursa. So I tried to define rehabilitation process of a neglected Ottoman monument that was constructed as a caravansaray uh, in 16th century, uh, together with this in Bursa. Uh, the method used in this case is presented as a part of my master thesis, uh, which is completed in between 2006 and 2008 uh, in uh, Middle University. And uh, I try to describe the contribution of advanced digital technologies in this work. Uh, the, the center, I, uh, I just uh, try to uh, give some information about very brief information about the historic center. At this Central of Bursa. You can see here commercial center with the red line. Uh, it is just attached to the Hisar of Bursa, which is from the Byzantine uh, times or the Prussian uh, times of Bursa, uh, between the empire from the empire. And then Ottoman Empire uh, go out to uh, Stadel and historic commercial center start to be built in between 15th century to 18th century. Uh, in, in the uh, in the 19th century, there was uh, some 
modernization movements in Ottoman Empire in urban planning uh, uh, activities and so uh, lots of uh, new roles were open and uh, you can see the roles here uh, and uh, the study area uh, can you see my arrow by the way I hope you can see. Yes, we can see it. Ah, okay, I, I tried to show some parts of the study area, so uh, it's very important for me. And so uh, this uh, you can see the study area that I will explain in detail. Uh, you can see uh, the uh, two monumental buildings, uh, which is divided into two by uh, these rows, uh, just in the uh, end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, so uh, this is uh, th there is a continuous sense of change, uh, uh, which requi requires to rehabilitate uh, the such kind of historic areas in Bursa. Uh, so when we explain the function of this British of uh, historic uh, commercial center, uh, it is composed of three parts, uh, titled as Rehan, Hamnar, and Kaihan districts, uh, and. There exists not only commercial, but also residential areas defining the function distribution of the center uh, and is being located, it is part of it, the study area here, again, uh, also includes two, uh, or two monumental buildings constructed in different periods of the Ottoman Empire and two storied historic buildings at the back part of it. Uh, uh, let me explain about the accessibility in, inside the center and accessibility to the study area. Uh, here, this, uh, while, uh, while I'm making the master thesis, uh, this road is open to the vehicle traffic, but today this road, Jumri Institute, is completely, uh, not completely, not limitedly uh, close to the vehicle traffic and open to the pedestrian access. Uh, but uh, in, in the in uh, 2008 it was opened uh, and so these uh, all the, these major uh, uh, used for the transportation within the city center of Bursa. So it is uh, the, the the location of the study area is very important for uh, again uh, the in the location and accessibility. Um, when we when we see uh, the original uh, the original. Uh, condition of the study area, you can see here the map of uh, Sufi Bey map, uh, the map of Bursa uh, dated to the 1862. Here you can see uh, under the name of Yintelhan, but it is uh, firstly constructed uh, as a caravansaray by the Ottomans in the uh, 16th century uh, under the name of Ali Pasha caravansaray. Uh, how can I know it? Because it is written in the, uh, uh, in the book uh, written for the uh, uh, the artifacts of Mimar Sinan, which was constructed uh, within the supervision of Mimar Sinan in the 16th century. It was written as Ali Pasha Kermansari. And then it, in the uh, Ottoman period time, uh, it is used as a grain uh, tahil, a grain han. Uh, so uh, it is just changed like that, but uh, the mass of the building uh, continues uh, to be like that uh, until the 19th century. Uh, and first, uh, first uh, the transformation activities started in the 19th century, started to be opened and completely uh, divided this monument into a few parts uh, and a new Han, uh, again, uh, constructed by the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century. And in, uh, this Han uh, is, is constructed with timber frame, not a stone masonry. And so it is a little bit different from the uh, original Han. Uh, and all the function was carried to, the, uh, to this new Han. So uh, the alteration started uh, just at the beginning of the 20th century in this area. Uh, and uh, also all these transformations continued in the Turkish Republican period, in addition to various transform restoration works done in the center. Uh, fortunately, a conservation development plan was prepared for uh, the historic commercial center uh, in, in 1989. And uh, it, it uh, the, is the outcome of a collaborative work composed of municipality, university, and local institutions it aims to regulate these continuous changes. Uh, in this plan, the study area uh, was designated as third special project area within the boundary of the urban sites to, to be conserved versus rapid transformation. Uh, moreover, there are uh, 34 parcels registered as including the remains 
and uh, 25 of which uh, still include some traditional uh, remains of these buildings. Uh, I try to discuss uh, just the value of the area a little bit in, in both site scale and building scale because uh, the building is very, uh, the, the remains of the building, the monument, uh, completely distributed in the area, as you can see in the plan. Uh, here you can see a view from the uh, Jumri Street, the intersection of Jumri Street and Nen Street. Uh, you can see the wall here. Uh, the wall is the uh, the eldest part of the Han. Uh, these shops were added uh, in the 19th, in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, so it has lots of values like financial, architectural, historical, and conservation values. Um, when you see here, uh, you can see these shops and these shops. Uh, there are lots of remains inside the shops, uh, but they are not. Uh, this one uh, might be the original uh, part of the uh, caravansaray, but these are uh, the upper. Can you follow me? I hope you can. Uh, the upper shops uh, along Jumri Street uh, are, were, were constructed uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, so uh, just to uh, use as the green hall again. Uh, and other remains within the city area, again, these uh, parts. Uh, it is very important because these parts are dated to the 20th century Ottoman Han uh, remains. Uh, so it's a multi-layered uh, study area, as you can understand, uh, but the upper floors of the Han is now uh, completely collapsed. Uh, so uh, we uh, did not, dis uh, we decided to work on just these caravansaray remains because they are much more original uh, for us to study on it. Uh, so uh, it continues like that. Uh, uh, th there is a view from the courtyard. I tried to give uh, this information very briefly. Uh, so I tried to uh, show you the uh, method of the study. So I passed very quickly. Uh, this is the view from the courtyard. So you can see the balcony part here or the gates uh, a little bit here. Um, so it continues like that and the inner uh, inner walls you can see of course the uh, construction technique and uh, original material of the home and here uh, due to the complex data informing multi-layered character of the study area various types of advanced digital technologies were used in assessing the general principles and interventions required to rehabilitate this site uh, the laser scanner, total station, and digital photogrammetry are used to measure and to locate the existing remains according to a common coordination system uh, during site survey, of course. Uh, and uh, afterwards, AutoCAD and MSR are the programs to draw the current condition of the remains, uh, whereas supported with different office programs, especially used in classification stage of the process. Uh, in addition to uh, the digital photogrammetry and AutoCAD, uh, geographic information systems is used to digitize the analysis to visualize the results while making a comprehensive evaluation in uh, past and present condition of the study area. It also provides the ability to integrate multiple layers of information referencing the existing diverse data sets during the preparation of conservation management plans for sustainable development of historic area. Uh, so it started with the documentation phase. In this phase, uh, the written and visual documents collected from the archival and literature research, uh, including all natural, special, and socioeconomic character of the study area, were used to prepare survey sheets and base maps for the size survey. Uh, and then digital photogrammetry was also used uh, to uh, get the most accurate and precise way to get systematically detailed visual information. Uh, and to be used in data, in data entry of JS in the following phases. Uh, the data transfer within the advanced documenting and modeling techniques from CAD to JS programs uh, was frequently used in this study to provide synchronization between different types of information about cultural heritage in different scales. Uh, the widely distributed remains of this monument uh, have complicated geometry or damaged structures 
as you can see, uh, and they required uh, advanced digital documentation techniques such as laser scanner and total station uh, to get quick and accurate measure drawings together with manual methods. By this uh, advanced documentation technique, it was possible to draw the plans and facades of historic remains, which cannot be reached and measured manually, uh, while producing the silhouette and street section easily. Besides, the surface photographs were rectified in MSR uh, to complete facade drawings in CAD format, hence it is able to document the current spatial and uh, structural conditions of the remains by using both manual and digital methods. When we discuss the, uh, the classification phase, the collected documents are grouped systematically according to the information differences about types and scales of cultural heritage, uh, which will define the spatial character uh, in, uh, according to historic buildings and new buildings together with the surrounding open areas, including courtyards, gardens, and dead end streets. Uh, in a digitization phase, uh, it is convenient to study all types of urban development and transformation activities uh, seen in and around such uh, cultural heritage uh, by preparing a digital map with the help of GIS techniques, uh, geographic information techniques, I think you know it, mismatching in drawing of master plans, major drawings and cadastral maps and aerial photographs uh, meets rectification works so uh, we uh, convert them into digital format to prepare for attribute data entry of written information. Uh, each of the classified information is defined with a code number uh, so as to be recorded into the system according to the format of the designed uh, database. Uh, this coding system would help to establish the structure of a utilizable documentation system by indicating an ID number for each special object to record collected data related to immobile culture properties. Uh, and it continues like that. Hence, uh, by this way, a thematic clusters of special objects and attribute data could be entered on the base map in JS format, which provides a detailed assessment in the following phases of the study. Uh, here you can see another part of the evaluation. Uh, here, uh, the outcomes based on a variety of uh, the analysis uh, with several dimensions were assessed in order to achieve proper decisions on the rehabilitation of cultural heritage in two different spatial scales. For instance, here you can see the changes in boundary of the buildings or the parcels according to the cadastra, according to the comparison of cadastral maps with the current uh, plans. So this would help us to get the idea for sustainability of uh, conservation and rehabilitation projects to be produced in the later stages of the study. Uh, on the other hand, a restitution project was also prepared to understand the periodical pre breakpoints in formation and transformation of the study area, uh, together with also this Ottoman caravansaray. Uh, and it was required to make a metric table to discuss the degree of reliability of collected and classified information uh, concerning the uh, existence, heights, locations, construction materials of related remains. And at last, uh, we found out, find, found out three periods of the uh, transform, urban transformation of the study area uh, until 1933. Uh, it is very systematical. However, due to the weakness in information concerning the temporal and spatial character of the infield new buildings, it was not possible to divide the third period as well. Uh, and in this process of the project, again, JS contributes in achieving various types of superpositions in result analysis in order to see the mobility in this alive but neglected urban uh, side. Functional continuity and current condition of existing tradition buildings were evaluated by comparing the related analysis. Here you can see. And besides the courtyards that are also open spaces identifying these monuments were also evaluated according to their legibility and functionality. And also new buildings were also analyzed according to the number of stories, mass proportions, locations, and purpose of the uh, usage. Uh, by this comprehensive evaluation, uh, it is possible to take decisions on which remains should be conserved and which buildings or additions should be eliminated. 
Okay, I'm finishing. Okay, <laughs> I have two minutes. Okay, I can see you. Uh, and at last, or at, at the end of the study, we didn't uh, directly make a restoration project, of course, but uh, we decided to make some conservation principles. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we tried to find out what we can do uh, afterwards. And in short, the vehicular traffic uh, should be regulated while the new multi-storied apartments are removed to clean surrounding heritage site. By this, it's possible to perceive the cultural properties in the study area and the commercial function should continue, especially by using the neglected inner space of the hands instead of construction of new shops. Uh, this would also provide functional sustainability in the study area. You can see some analysis. And the courtyards of the hands also should be cleaned. Uh, uh, to reveal its traditional character and especially the remains of the caravansaray should be excavated or presented uh, in order to make public awareness in this cultural heritage. Uh, and we decided not to rebuild uh, all the uh, missed parts of the monument because we, we thought that uh, the road, the Jumni Street and industry is very important for us because they are witness to the 19th century's uh, westernization movements of the Ottoman Empire. So we just find out it and present it, uh, but not reconstruct it. Uh, you can find detailed information about the thesis or the article that I published a few years ago. So uh, if you want, I can share it with you in the chat uh, part. But it is essential to mention that all these results were prepared by the help of GS, which provides successful and cost-efficient operations Rehabilitates of such kind of multi-layered and mostly destroyed urban heritage size in both building and size scales. And so you can see here the three D drawings again prepared by JS in uh, many years ago. So they are just uh, not a professional drawings, but you can understand the mess in the study area, and you can understand uh, how they are not uh, per uh, pursued by the uh, public, but after the uh, re rehabilitation proposed, maybe we can perceive them and we can make a public awareness on it. And uh, we can uh, see it by the help of advanced technologies in a digital format. Uh, thank you very much. I hope. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sermin. Um, You're welcome. The wonderful uh, typo uh, typology and uh, presentation. Uh, thank you. So let's move You're to welcome. the next speaker. Um, our next speaker is uh, Alexia Karal. Sorry. Uh, our next speaker is Alexia Karalam Bos from University of Florence. Um, she has graduated in architecture in 2016 at the Department of Architecture of the University of Florence. She has a research grant from the Department of Architecture of the University of Florence on the topic of information management of real estate assets by using methodologies and tools in BIM. She took part in various digital surveys by laser grammatory, and she is active in a wide range of subjects about generative architecture and design, physical solvers, and genetic algorithms. She carries out research with a special interest in the use of interoperability uh, between applications in order to facilitate the automation of procedures and parameter parameterization of content in the BIM via the use of following visual programming platforms. Grasshopper, a plugin for MacNeil, Rhino Cyrus, 3D, and Autodesk, Autodesk Dynamo, a plugin for Autodesk Revit. She is going to uh, explain today a topic about generative modeling from architecture to archaeology. Thank you so much for your introduction. Uh, I would like to convert my screen. Let me just have a look. Divide. Here it is. Oh, not from the beginning. I'm so sorry. So I would like to introduce you to the um, uh, to the generative modeling from architecture to archaeology through the algorithms through Grasshopper and Dynamo. Uh, Dynam is a graphical uh, programming interface. Graphical programming is just you're using codes. 
like programming. But if you're not uh, uh, capable, like writing the codes like Python, like the programmers do in the films, you can do that through a graphical uh, visual. Uh, so as you can see here, there are all these uh, small things that you see, the gray uh, boxes, that's the algorithms, and then you connect them through the wires between them. You can use to generate the algorithms to analyze your data, to read, edit your data from the outside sources, from the program that you want to use. You can also create the geometry, also the most complex geometry in the simple way. And, um, and Dynamo itself inside Revit, it can edit all of the parameters of Revit and also all of the geometry. And the advantage is that the graphs that you use inside the algorithms like Dynamo, Grasshopper and everything, that you can use them from project to project. So if you are uh, capable and, uh, um, uh, and you uh, do and program your algorithms in a way that you know in that project, you're gonna do this thing uh, like uh, this project, uh, uh, you can use them into the, your whole work and from you can use them also from project to project. So in the first time, it's going to take you some more time to build the first uh, algorithms. But uh, afterwards, you can use that. And with just a simple click, you're going to do all of your work. So you have to be precise uh, and do that with a lot of accuracy. So if we are capable of link the computer to run the calculation and execute the commands and perform the data entry, there's going to be a major reduction for the human error to be done. So this is a fun way. So how algorithms work? Algorithms uh, work like the recipe in the kitchen. So you have your input, like the ingredients, and then the procedure, like when you cook, and then you have your output, like your meal. But if you do them quite easily, you're going to have all of your meals just ready with one click. Uh, oh, this one, it doesn't work because I had here a video how it says, like, if you're in your Revit project, you have a lot of mistakes, like, or you want to change, like, the cafeteria with the, uh, or the electrical, like you see here, like, now it's written correctly. If you just connect and you do your Excel with all of the corrections that you want to do, you build your graph correctly, then you, when you connect this, uh, this output to this input, like the value, it's going to correct every single mistake that you're done in, uh, in the quickest way. Because if not, if you want to do that by hand or manually, you have to open every single um, uh, parameter of Revit you can do that also to the comments. You can do that uh, so quickly and it's going to save you so much time. So here in these, um, in these sites, like the dynamobeam.org and the dynamoprimer.com, you're going to find all of the videos that can help you to learn Dynamo. And Grasshopper is a different uh, um, program. It's like a plugin for Reno. Uh, it works in the same way, uh, working with algorithms that you connect them with the wires. It is extremely more flexible, in my opinion. It's much easier to modify things, but it works also only in Reno. Uh, but it's better, in my modest opinion, for to create the geometry. Grasshopper, it's much way easier to uh, create the geometry that you want. And Dynamo is much easier to use and uh, for changing all the parameters inside Revit. So all of the models that you're doing inside Rhino, they're gonna be extremely flexible and so easy to modify. And um, in, in order though to have this um, program to work, you need to change your way of thinking for your design. So you will need to understand what you want to de design, how you want it to work, and then you have to go step by step. So if you want to do like a chair, you have to decide. I want to parameterize the, the legs of the chair. So I need that one. Uh, so if that depends a lot about uh, the program and how to organize your file in a way to make it work most fast. Um, 
And then there's also right now a, a new plugin for a Grasshopper to work inside Reno, inside a Revit, I'm so sorry. Uh, so you can use Grasshopper and uh, all of its capabilities as inside Revit. So you, could, you will have 300 Revit aware components that Grasshopper can change, query and modify and analyze in a way that you can create a native uh, element inside Revit. And you can find this plugin uh, at the site reno3d.com. So these are some examples I found how you can use also uh, Grasshopper inside archaeology. This is a really nice example where you can find also the collaboration between the architects and the archaeologists because here, as you see, they've done a reconstruction of the medieval proto-urban of the Pukuts in Poland. The result was a digital model of the uh, urban tissue based on the parametric methods used by the 3D printing. So they've done all of their, um, um, they've done all of the, um, and laser scanning, and then they've used the grasshopper. Uh, here you can see the grasshopper, the inputs, and these are the outputs. They had about 50 parameters defined to control everything from the form because they wanted to know and uh, have a look how everything works inside uh, uh, grasshopper. And um, then they used the uh, a matrix of possible solution used at the, the base to shape a grammar strategy. And this is called the Pulsuk reconstruction. I'm so sorry about the pronunciation. Uh, and was developed using Grasshopper for Rhino that allows the visual control of parametric inputs. In this way, they were capable in so such a simple way to uh, develop 140 hertz uh, just imagine, if you want to design 140 hearts by hand, it's going to take you so much time. Instead, through Grasshopper, if you put all the correct inputs, you're going to have, you, you're going to do that much more easily and much faster. And then here you can see um, the reconstruction from the first level they've done. And the navigation buttons here allow the user to display one of the th 16 reconstructed levels. And then here you can see the, three, uh, the 3D printer te technique they've used to do for uh, the research. Also, there is another thing that I'm really interested in that are the revolutionary um, uh, algorithms that is Grasshopper, uh, Galapagos. Galapagos is also a plugin for Grasshopper. And um, evolutionary algorithms, um, they work like the evolution, like for people. But they have, the, um, they're, um, they're really slow sometimes, and they do not guarantee a solution. But sometimes they're rem remarkably flexible and they're able to get you a, a wide variety of problems and solutions. And then you can also see them, the solutions when it's running. So you can choose also the best one for you. For here, for example, here you're going to have your problem, uh, your landscape. So if you want just to have the peaks, the evolutionary, um, the evolutionary Oh, it's it's wrong. This one was the first one. It's going to populate your um, your landscape with all this population, and then you're going to have this one that is going to be the next population that gets towards the peaks, and then afterwards the next population it's going to get towards more the peaks. So the solution it's going to be on the peaks. So when you do the evolutionary solvers, you have to tell it also for the inputs that you want to do, and then the fitness. The fitness can be also maximized or minimized, and then you're gonna have all of the solutions uh, also in the middle. So from here, you can see how it's optimizing everything, and then you can choose the solution that works best for you. So you're gonna have the best genome, after the algorithms, uh, um, they, 
uh, they worked with it. Um, so the evolutionary also work like the uh, for people like the the DNA, and here they work also from the initialization. Then you're gonna have an evaluation of uh, your genome, and then you, they, it's gonna select the best one, and then it's gonna do the application, and then it's gonna turn all the way around until you're gonna guess your best result. So you're gonna have your population, the evaluation, the selection, the crossover, then the mutation, and then the fitness that it's gonna be your answer. And also uh, I would like to introduce you for the evolution as resolvers to this really nice example that is done for the wooden trust analysis for the preservation strategies inside uh, the, um, yeah, this theater at Bologna. They've done all of their, um, all of their um, uh, analysis of the structure and then they constructed all of the generative algorithms in a way that it could improve the compensation of the wooden structure behavior during their uh, entire life, uh, lifespan. So in this way, it automatically creates a building information modeling in BIM because they've used the grasshopper and then they put it inside Reno chairs and then they've done the uh, rabbit program. They introduce everything inside Dynamo and inside Revit. I'm, I'm sorry. So from here, you can see the theater. Here, you can see all of the structures of the, uh, of the wood. And this is the original configuration. This is the addiction of readers. And this is the connection with the vault. And this is the installation of the Newton Technological System. So what they do, they got all of the parameters inside Grasshopper. And then they've used Calabacos to get the best solution and to have the best selections of uh, the how the model and how the and how they would uh, behaved inside their inside the time. So from there, they took from the uh, grasshopper algorithms that it was linked inside Dynamo, and then from Dynamo it got inside Revit. And from here, you can have also a look how with uh, the selection that are representing the Western Raptors. And this is a plan of the roof extracted from the point cloud. And this is also another really nice example how grasshopper can be used inside for H beam because this one is a church of San Nicola in Montedoro in Italy. And they were trying to guess the best uh, geometry and to work inside the parameter and uh, inside par parameterize their model. So they've done their um, photogrammetry. They got the point cloud. So they got insight from Grasshopper, then to Rhinoceros, and then they got everything inside Revit. So from here, you can have a look at all the point cloud inside uh, Rhinoceros. And then from Grasshopper, they parameterize the model so they can have a simultane simultaneous modeling of the walls inside the 3D software used for the creation of the parametric object and this is Reno inside Grasshopper and from there uh, they managed to put it inside Revit. So here you can also have a look how you can use also Grasshopper using the point cloud using Arena 4D, because here they did the uh, Altare. Uh, this is a 3D representation of the altar inside the Rhinoceros, and they parameterize it too. And from here, you can have a look how they, trans they can transform everything inside the 3D model of the altar from Rhinoceros, and then they can input it inside the Revit so they can have their beam model and then they can put all of the parameters, uh, all of the characteristics of the, uh, of the model and all of the um, materials 
and then can process all everything inside from the grasshopper uh, inside the bravate environment. And so here you can also have a look uh, for the point cloud of the 3D modeling of the fresco inside uh, rhinoceros. And then from there, they were able to uh, work from grasshopper. So in can implement grasshopper for the transformation between uh, rhinoceros and rabbit and vice versa. So if you change anything inside rabbit, it's gonna change it directly inside the uh, rhinoceros. But if you uh, want to change something or your uh, um, if you just um, understood that you did a mistake with a simple click right here or in the inputs of Grasshopper, you can have instantly everything changed by the uh, one click inside also Revit. And this is all I have to say about generative modeling. It's just a small talk about generative and algorithms and I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Alex for your nice presentation. Um, okay, let's move to the other speaker. Um, mm, okay, so the Professor Sandro uh, Perriniello from University of Bavia is an associate professor at DICAR, Department of Civil Engineering and Architecture of University of Bavia. Uh, he's a PhD in present representation and survey sciences with the title of European Research Doctor. Since uh, 2012, he has been visiting professor at Perm National Research Polytechnic University of Russia. And in 2015, he received an honorary degree from the State Academy of Civil Engineering and Architecture in Odessa in Ukraine. In 2011, he was appointed expert and voting member as referent for Italy to the International Scientific Committee ECOFORT, ICOMOS International Scientific Committee on Fortifications and Military Heritage. In 2016, he was visiting professor at Krakow Polytechnic University in Poland, and in 2017, he obtained the National Scientific Qualification as full professor. He is director of laboratory DADA Lab and of joint laboratory of landscape survey and design of University of Pavia. He is responsible of numerous national and international research projects as member of editorial committees of international scientific series and journals, and he has organized numerous international conferences on the subject of heritage documentation. Uh, he will be presenting to us a subject of integrated survey for the documentation of a historic center at risk, the case study of Beit Lahm. Uh, stage of yours is yours, Professor Sandro, please. Hello, hello, good morning to everybody. I share my screen. Yes, please. Do you see the screen? Yes, we can see it clearly. Can you go for screen? Okay, yes. and, and hear the voice. So thank you for the uh, introduction and presentation. It's Parinello without the second D, but for the rest, <laughs> thank you. Sorry, sorry for pronunciation. Fine, fine. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so I will uh, make the, the presentation about these uh, case studies that regard the historic center of Bethlehem and talking about a research project that is 3D Bethlehem management and control of, of urban growth for the development of heritage and improvement of life in the city of Bethlehem that was financed by the um, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the, and the AIX Agency of International Cooperation of Italy with several partners, uh, the main, the municipality of Pavia and the municipality of Bethlehem that have this twinning between them and the two universities, University of Pavia and Bethlehem with several laboratories. The project was developed in 18, 19 and 20. Then for the COVID-19, it was postponed uh, till the, well, it actually it will close in the end of the year, I, I, I think. Um, um, the staff from the universities, uh, after me, is our professor, also Maurizio Bocconcino for Polytechnic of uh, Turin, and uh, uh, different laboratories of the uh, uh, University of uh, uh, Pavia, Laboratory of Urbanistic, Laboratory of Technology, and Dada Lab, that is the Laboratory of Survey and Representation with the uh, researcher, PhD, and, and, and so on. 
So Bethlehem, uh, Bethlehem in Middle East is very close to Jerusalem. This is the, from Google, uh, here we can see the, so of Bethlehem, it basically it's quite attached to Jerusalem. It's a hill with a very dense edification and a urban uh, center. I took uh, in 2013 some historic picture from the Pope of the Basilic uh, of the Nativity Church when it was starting the uh, restoration of the Nativity Church. We was involved in the documentation of the church, so I found to the Pope some historic picture that are quite useful now for understand uh, the landscape and the quality of this historic center. In front of us in this picture, the Basilica of the Nativity Church, so the Nativity Church with the entrance uh, and um, this aspect of a fortress from the Crusader period. And on the opposite side, the historic center of uh, Bethlehem, where we can find a lot of uh, traditional uh, house that's called Hosh, with uh, um, this uh, growing of building one over another, and uh, uh, an image that from 1927 that show how was the landscape of Bethlehem, quite close to how the Italian, for example, imagined when they built the. Um, at Christmas time, no? the, 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 the maquette of Bethlehem. Uh, but by the way, um, this uh, uh, territory is very um, um, frequent to have uh, um, a earthquake. Uh, so um, see, it's a, a, a seismic area. And um, each wall of the houses there is uh, uh, made by uh, an evolution of uh, centuries. So each wall contain in this memory an history about the uh, evolution of the uh, historic center. We can find uh, stone from the Roman till the Crusade uh, and so on in a different uh, area in, in quite in every building of the uh, of the historic center and that picture show how it changed from 1927 till 2016 and if we could have another picture now imagine how it's changing in the last five years that's a lot also so uh, this big changing of landscape uh, it's cause of uh, several uh, um, fact, uh, the immigration because of the war, so the huge density of people that work, uh, that, that live in Bethlehem. But by the way, uh, 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 this uh, high increasing of building uh, corresponds to not so high quality or level of construction, so um, a risk in a way for the uh, stability of the structure of this historic center. Uh, and the project took in consideration this part that is exactly the historic center of the town. The center is coincident with the um, Manger Square and the Nativity Church, uh, and with the idea to create an instrument for the municipality to let them know better how to manage the complexities of this uh, uh, historic uh, complex. Um, we can see from this picture taken from, taken from the drone, how is the density and uh, how is the condition of this building uh, with uh, uh, traces on the roof, uh, uh, um, different level of building that grows and grows one over another. So um, to, uh, to build this instrument that correspond, and we will see uh, to a GIS system, we put in act a deep survey action with digital uh, documentation and digital instrument and so on. We're starting from an analysis of this uh, morphology, uh, taking consideration all this aspect that characterize the facade, the front of the building, the quality of this narrow street, uh, and so on, uh, to uh, uh, achieve uh, uh, 3D data uh, about uh, uh, this morphology. 
um, the, and to uh, let them uh, have an instrument that give them the possibility to uh, look the city from the entire uh, system till the detail of uh, uh, each infrastructure that we can see, for example, over a roof of an historic building uh, and so on. And uh, uh, in this instrument to uh, let them know how much complex are all the uh, facade with uh, uh, all this history that is not written on, on in any book of course but is written over a wall uh, and so a survey at the urban scale with a, a deep attention uh, to the ar architecture so the combination of several instruments that we put together from terrestrial laser scanning mobile laser scanning and uh, uh, photogrammetric survey does with, with the photographic campaign uh, with the UAV system with drones and from terrestrial uh, campaign of acquisition. So we combine all this procedure uh, to um, dividing the, the, the historic center in uh, area, for example, to uh, realize uh, the survey, in this case, the photogrammetric survey with, with drones uh, at two levels, one main level of flight over the entire uh, city and one more, uh, more close to the building with the smallest drone to achieve all the facade. And uh, we did terrestrial laser scanning. This point cloud that we are looking now, it's made by 2,600 more or less scan, a bit more, but 2,600 scan, and each one of them is about five, six minutes of uh, uh, time acquisition, and then moving and moving and moving in each street uh, um, uh, to obtain this sort of radiography uh, of the historic center. It's uh, the, the, the point cloud where we collect all the streets, path, uh, and public. Uh, uh, space, of course, less information about all the gardens where there is no accessibility, uh, cause of a lot of monasteries and private zone where it was very difficult to access. But the, we integrate such data with the drone. So the overlapping of these two system of information give us a 3D database of the entire historic center. And here we can see the uh, point cloud from terrestrial laser scanning of the city, where we can uh, understand the morphological complexity into the database. So the first output of this project is to collect a 3D database on the historic center of Bethlehem and the, uh, a very accurate uh, um, information system in this case, where we can see each stone uh, of the wall inside uh, the, uh, a huge database. And in this picture, we see that the, the data uh, from laser integrate with the data uh, to, by the drone. So uh, to collect all the information about the roof, for example. Um, uh, some picture that describe the uh, the database that we was using. This was the first uh, step of uh, of the project to uh, achieve such uh, such database. Then we define the level of detail uh, that was useful to use to representing this complexity, and we define a level that is in the middle between. Uh, uh, urban scale and, uh, and architectonic scale. So um, creating a 3D model that stay a bit in the middle. I mean, it, it's a 3D model for urbanistic that talk about the architecture. Hmm? So with two level, two, two, two different phase of modeling, one macro modeling and one micro more in the detail. So the, uh, the first step, the macro modeling, is to uh, step from the point cloud directly to the uh, geometrical reconstruction att attached to the point cloud. Um, uh, picking the points and building the, uh, the mesh uh, surface. And the second, to using the photogrammetry, 
to, uh, and the and the point cloud tool to model uh, uh, on the facade of each building, and doing that we, uh, was creating also a uh, nabacos of technological uh, models, architectural and constructive models, to um, create a sort of box with all the constructive elements of the city useful for the next transformation. I mean, uh, after several months of work, we obtain an entire 3D model of the, of the city, but the city continues to change. So uh, it's very important to understand how these 3D model could change in future using uh, uh, more or less the same uh, 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 constructive element, more, more or less. So uh, there is a big abacus of element that can be used to uh, easily change uh, the 3D model of the building. That's are some point of view of different uh, areas inside the 3D model realized uh, as a uh, 3D base for all the consideration. And uh, so this uh, mixed level between uh, urban and architectonic. And uh, um, this uh, phase of 3D modeling was so uh, big, of course. Uh, then the um, uh, chances activity on each building to understand the technological infrastructure, the constructive apparatus of each uh, uh, building unit uh, and to transform this 3D model in a sort of 3D ge uh, geographic information system. Of course, it's a 2D GIS, but based on 3D model. So uh, for each front, for each building, we define a, a, a code um, that link with a specific number, uh, each building unit, each front, to the uh, main uh, complexity of the historic center. And we create uh, several drawings like this that was, was useful also to uh, create the 3D model um, to have the uh, better understanding of the complexity of this historic center. When it was possible, we also was going inside some um, in some building unit inside to uh, understand also the uh, constructive system and so on. But uh, this research project is focused more on the uh, public space and uh, outside. So it was very few, the building in which we was inside and we collect also information from inside. So this code, uh, as we can see here, uh, link each facade, each window to a building unit, to a uh, uh, um, textile unit, to an area. And uh, so with a single code, we can have the connection between uh, the 3D model and uh, a schedule, a schedule uh, in which we collect all information about each facade, Col uh, information about the constructive uh, analysis, technological, and so on. So the uh, schedule was made in um, FileMaker uh, to have a better uh, use of uh, easy use of for the uh, graphic aspect of the schedule itself. So. Um, all aspect about roof, uh, the, what is visible and what is not, uh, the material and the technical system uh, that is are placed on the roof, uh, and the infrastructure. But also over a front, uh, on, on the front we have uh, other information and more or less are 55 descriptor for each uh, um, front and less on, on, the, on the roof. So connecting the, uh, the schedule, the database of the census and 
with the database of the um, 3D model, uh, we have the, this uh, uh, GIS uh, system in which we can have information about uh, building unit, click on the roof, the front, uh, specifically uh, over the facade, and the different streets and open space, uh, clicking there. So um, the code is the link to uh, connect different data, and at the end, uh, the uh, system uh, give us thematic map uh, in which we can see function, uh, condition uh, of the building, problem uh, in uh, stability, or uh, one of these uh, 55 query that we can make to the system. Uh, also, if there are some structural control required to, because of problem of stability, uh, um already uh, um, so in the in, in the uh, in the survey and so on i don't know if now you can see the um, the video if the connection is good or not there is a, a short video that describe more or less the um the product of this uh, research here we see the researcher uh, during the survey campaign um, it was a very nice uh, human experience also to live there for months, uh, to be in contact uh, with the people, to work with them, because uh, this, uh, uh, all this activity was made together with the municipality of uh, Bethlehem and their technician. So some um, video of a drone that take the <laughs> video of another drone and so on. And the uh, all different. Uh, you have two minutes uh, left, uh, Professor Sam. Sorry, you have two minutes left. So maybe we should wrap up. Yeah, yeah, I'm closing. So um, let's see the the different. I, I will jump this uh, uh, the the point cloud uh, and uh, photogrammetry. To, to see the 3D model uh, that came from uh, from all these uh, survey database. And this digital maquette, this digital twin, let you uh, travel virtually into the city and touch different object receiving information and collecting uh, all data to uh, manage and uh, uh, understand uh, how to design the future city of uh, um, of Bethlehem well there are some image of the video that show uh, this uh, very big 3d model uh, and and at the end we see the, the system of GIS in which we can ch choose the color, choose the thematic uh, map that we want to uh, have for the information. And then um, there is the possibility to see the, all the building at the same time or make a query uh, on a specific uh, building. So uh, image during the work together with the um, worker of the municipality and also a training course that we close in the last May uh, to let them know how to work with this uh, um, with this instrument that was very important. So the link for the uh, laboratory in uh, website, Facebook, Instagram and YouTube when you can find some information more maybe about the activity uh, of the laboratory in, uh, in University of Pavia. Very much, uh, Professor Sandro. Would you please uh, share the link to the others on the chat, please? Sure. If that's possible. Okay. Meanwhile, let's move to the other speaker. Uh, we have Professor Roberta Spallone. Ciao, Roberta. Ciao, Sandro. Hi, everybody. Hello. 
Uh, okay, let's move uh, to the introduction. She is uh, Professor Spallone is from Politecnico di Torino. She is an architect, PhD, full professor at the Politecnico di Torino at the Department of Architecture and Design. Uh, she teaches in the Laboratory of Drawing and Survey and Digital Techniques of Representation. She is author of 200 publications concerning history and criticism of architectural drawings and digital technologies for graphical analysis and reconstructive modeling. Her recent research links uh, AI and AR with the CH. In this research field, she chairs with Andrea, with Andrea uh, uh, Giordano and Michel uh, Rosso, the REAACHID, Representation for Enhancement and Management through Augmented Reality and Artificial Intelligence, Cultural Heritage and Innovative Design Symposium. Uh, she is going to present to us 3D modeling of voltage systems Appartamento di Mezzanotte in Palazzo Carignano and the atrium of Palazzo Mazzonis in Turin. The stage is yours, uh, Professor Spallone. Thank you very much, Luei, for your presentation. Really, we are uh, uh, in uh, um, four people, uh, me, Marco Vitali, Francesca Ronco, and Fabrizio Natta. And uh, now, thank you, Fabrizio. Um, we are from the Department of Architecture and Design at Politecnico di Torino. Uh, and uh, we can go on with the object of the research. Uh, the research on a complex voltage system has characterized my and Marco Vitale's work for about 10 years, together with the international colleagues and PhD students in our group. These are voltage system and brickworks uh, built in the Baroque period in Piedmont by famous masters such as Guarini and Ivara, by local masters and by unknown uh, architects over the course of a century, starting from the 1780s. Uh, today, we present two case studies, the voltage system built by Guarino Guarini in Palazzo Carignano and those in the atrium of Palazzo Mazzonis in Turin. This lecture is a showcase of our expertise and our experience uh, that we will apply during the summer school. Uh, the aim of the research is uh, to delineate and explain uh, through the geometric analysis uh, uh, of architectural artifacts uh, the links uh, between theorization, transformation, and changes uh, of the reference geometric models and the real buildings. The communication and sharing of the results of the research use uh, digital modeling and digital fabrication. Every aspect of the representation built with the architectural creative process, as well as the construction of the building. We mean the scripted geometry as a scientific method for the creation of the design shapes. Drawing as a language for the control and verification of formal hypotheses. Survey as a system of knowledge and interpretation ranging from design ideas to the existing building. Reconstructive digital modeling as a tool for deepening the geometric reasoning in the sources, the designs, and the realized buildings. Visualization and rendering as a tool for understanding and communicating the relationships between shapes, geometry, construction features, and decorative apparatus. Digital fabrication as a tool for transmitting and sharing by physical models in a design for all perspective. The link between uh, geometry and architecture was uh, one of the most significant domains of Guarini scientific research. It had uh, significant results in the architectural practice, bringing art and science into a single system. 
During uh, his stay in Turin, Guarini published some of his most relevant treatises uh, and created uh, some uh, several some uh, religious and civil buildings characterized by new geometrical shaped vault system. Among them, the vaults uh, in Palazzo Carignano, whose first design drawings date back to uh, 1778 and 1679. Guarini developed the systematic reasoning on vaulted system into three treatises, the Architettura Civile, the Euclides ad Autus, and the Modo di Misurare le Fabbriche. In uh, these books, uh, he treated uh, with uh, text and images, uh, the geometric origin, the stereotomy, and the measurement of the vaults, uh, respectively. In the Architettura Civile, Guarini established a real vocabulary of shapes of vault uh, geometrically based, starting from the six round bodies. The combination of these primitive surfaces by cut and composition gives rise uh, to the well-known vaults uh, like the barrels, conical, conoidal, cross, cloisters, vaults, uh, and to domes, sails, and pendentives. Finally, there are the lunette vaults composed by a main vault, barrel, cross, cloister, dome, sail, that is cut and filled by goals. In the Modo di Misurare le Fabbriche, Guarini expressed the, the desire to make the geometric principles developed in the Euclides and Autus applicable and accessible, teaching the methods for the calculation of the intradose surface of the vaults. Among more, more than 30 shape variations, there are several formal novelties in comparison to the Architettura Civile. This is due to the reference to different directrices, semi-ellipse, arc or circumference, arc of ellipse, and pointed arc. The workflow of the research, developed as a wall that can be summarized in three main phases, survey, interpretation, and modeling, in the second case study, is extended to the transmission of knowledge by physical models, demonstrating its potential in a design for all perspective. The interpretation phase, that is the core of the research, involved an approach that aims to build the theoretical models underlying the design of the balls, integrating the survey data with the knowledge of the sources. This approach is performed through the abstraction and regularization of survey data to highlight the axial symmetries of the voltage system concerning the compositional rules between the geometrical surface independently from the irregularities of the construction. The formulation of hypotheses about the geometrical nature of the design starts from the study of the significant section lines extracted from the point cloud to identify similarities and correspondence with the sources. The section lines are discretized by course and constitute the matrices of the geometric reference surfaces. The composition of the reference surfaces may cause the interpretative model that is re-evaluated concerning the sources of the survey data. The alternative geometric hypothesis formulated on the design idea can be profitably evaluated by superimposing the ideal models to the survey models, verifying the displacement between the two surfaces. Go, Fabrizio. Yeah, yeah. The geometric analysis uh, of the vaults of the Appartamento di Mezzanotte in Palazzo Carignano was carried out by me in my master thesis dated uh, 2019 under the supervision of uh, Roberta Spallone, Marco Vitali, and Edoardo Piccoli. The apartment currently has 10 rooms, of which only two have not been analyzed as they did not have re re relevant covering structures. The other rooms, which in the study follow the original nomenclature from the Savoy inventories of uh, 1710, 
have double legged rooms toward the courts, rooms at a lower height facing the street side and, and uh, along central gallery that divides and connects the two sides. The metric survey was carried out uh, with the integration of low cost and fast technique of uh, structure from motion and direct survey. The photographs were taken with a reflex camera and were subsequently post produced to regulate the, and uh, homogenize the photographic shots, uh, shots in uh, excessively underposed rooms. The photograms, uh, uh, see the photographs were, were then uploaded in the software edit of the Metashape with uh, which the point clouds and the texture mesh of the vault were processed. Uh, the analysis of the geometric features and elements of the vaulted system led uh, to the use of uh, additional software, which is a 3D reshaper, for creating the point clouds, uh, extracting the light section, and generating the mesh visualized by the solid view. From the, from the geometric point of view, this mesh, model, this mesh model already provides all the information necess necessary for the purpose. Indeed, uh, by intersecting section planes aligned to X, Y, and Z axis, uh, uh, you can obtain an orthogonal grid uh, made up uh, by the line section exportable to CAD software. These line sections were used as a basis for creating, for creating 3D CAD models. The problem facing the rooms dealt with the closure and completeness of the point cloud due to the various factors. A uh, non homogeneous artificial lighting system, presence of curtains uh, along the walls, and presence of furniture through, through the floor, uh, floor area. The vault of the prima anticamera. Uh, no. The vault of the prima anticamera is re recognizable as a fascia vault that means banded. Indeed, two polycentric arches divide the space to be covered into three parts: the central one, doubled, and the sides. Uh, along the major sides of the rooms, there are lower arches uh, for side lean on the on the main arches. The three vaults delimited by the bands look, uh, look like a sail vault, but the analysis of the 3D survey model reveals a particular surface discontinuity that allows us, that allows, uh, that allows us to classify the three vaults uh, as a cross vault. They can be created by the intersection of uh, four rampant groins defined by parallel section lines. The vault of the Camera Grande del Letto shows a more complex uh, composition of surface than uh, the previous one. These rooms also is divided by a polycentric arches into three parts. The vaults that cover the sides of the room can be read as a semi aconca vaults that can be traduced in English with the term, uh, with the term shell like. For aconca vault, we mean a double curvature vault with three directories where the lateral ones are straight and the central ones, the central ones are curved. These sides vaults are cut in the corners by covered surface and filled by, uh, by cell-like bolts. The central vault can be assim uh, assimilated to a cell-like surface. The central sail is cut by a cylindrical surface, uh, gener generating a section, uh, section line tangent to the bands, almost flat, regularized by plaster frames. On its say a rota uh, rotational ellipsoid, uh, ellipsoid basing. Marco, is your turn. Thank you so much. Um, some conclusive uh, consideration on this case study has demonstrated the theoretical and geometrical scheme of the original design is very often hidden in the built architecture because of the technique of masonry, the superimposition of plaster, and the pictorial decoration too. So, we think that the representation tool can be profitably used to allow research advanced above the geometry of a vaulted system and also to support the dissemination and enhancement of cultural heritage. This last image is composed with a particular didactic aim. The ideal model realized using AutoCAD is rendered with the 3D Studio Max and compared to the um, structure for motion textured model of the vault. The overlap of the two models highlights in a single image the geometry of the shape, uh, sorry, the geometry of the space, the shape of the built architecture, and those simulated by the pictorial decoration. The different model connect geometry, architectural construction, and decoration that could underline the, or dissimulate the mm, geometric structure. 
Now the second uh, case study. Uh, this one is one of the outcome of an international collaboration for a project that is named Nuevas Tecnologías para el Análisis y Conservación del Patrimonio Arquitectónico, funded by the Ministry of Science, Innovation and the University of Spain in 2019. This project is focused on the entrances of Baroque palaces in Turin, and in particular on the atriums characterized by brick-made vault of extraordinary geometric complexity. Although their relevance in the architectural coeval panorama has been highlighted by some historian as Palmer and Norberg Schulz, uh, that uh, are uh, <clears throat> because they are unknown to the citizens and uh, excluded from the touristic group even if are very important from the historical point of view. Uh, the general objective of the research is to make the museum visitors appreciate the architectural quality of the building that houses the collections. In addition, the variety of uses has led to communication choices in the educational field that can overcome cultural, linguistic and age barriers. The intrinsic tactile potential of the physical models becomes an opportunity to extend to visually impaired users the perception of the spaces in which they move. The particular objective is to make comprehensible the geometric complexity of space generated uh, in the vaulted system by sophisticated operations of just like position, cutting and intersection between surfaces that were widespread in the architectural culture of the time. The metric survey has been carried out through Faro Focus laser scanner that integrate a digital camera. The articulation of the spaces and the cesure generated by three columns and pillars connected by architraves to the perimeter walls required careful planning of the scanner position to avoid blind areas. The scans have been imported in Autotask 3D recap Pro software, applying a standard filter to each scan in order to remove weak point and aberration. The recording and automatic alignment of the point clouds benefit of the use of reference spheres easily identified by the software. Once the processing is complete, cleaning um, the unnecessary points and, and segmenting the building, um, then the segmentation of the building has been carried out. The drawing and modeling phases consist in the creation of architectural drawing through AutoCAD and the three-dimensional model obtained through Rhino Zeros by surfaces that connects the section of the point cloud that discretize the interior surface. They are regularized and approximated to elementary figures obtaining the ideal geometries that underlie the vaulted system. The two phases of two-dimensional representation in 3D modeling testify different and complementary intention, which on the one hand aim to return the architectural features in detail according to the scale of representation identified as the most suitable for the work, and on the other end, to show the design idea and its connection with the geometry. Now, uh, Francesca, the stage is yours for the digital fabrication. Thank you, Marco. Uh, yes, um, digital fabrication aimed at producing tactile models for cultural heritage transmission is the new outcome uh, to this uh, workflow. In this phase, uh, two types of digital fabrication fabricated models of the atrium vaults have been realized at a scale of 1 to 50. The aim was to fabricate illustrative models morphologically similar to the real vault instead of its exact copy. Uh, sections uh, have been uh, the key instrument for virtual and physical modeling of the vaulted system. In the first uh, model, these sections have been transformed in real tangible interlocked planar slices uh, using a mesh joinery approach. Uh, 
Uh, for these, uh, the shape is composed of several interconnected uh, planar sections. Such portion can be easily fabricating uh, using any 2D cutting device. And uh, in this case, uh, we have used uh, Trotec uh, Speedy 400 of uh, ModLab uh, Arc um, Model Laboratory, um, employing a relatively uh, inexpensive material uh, such as cardboard, and then uh, assembled uh, through a sequence of manual operations. The sections uh, obtain, uh, obtained from the point cloud have, be, have become tangible elements uh, of the real model, consisting of an orthogonal mesh of fifths uh, interconnected uh, with each other. Uh, the observation of the waste uh, uh, material, uh, material of the cutting process, as you can see uh, in the image uh, on the bottom left uh, part of the, the slide, uh, has led to some considerations uh, on the fabrication of a new model with the voids and solids uh, reversed, so that uh, the observer can uh, perceive the curvature of the surface uh, touching it uh, uh, from above. Uh, the 3D digital model uh, um, uh, before described uh, has been used in the perspective of uh, tactile fruition. The spaces are represented in negative to obtain a handy object that allows to perceive the intradus surface, surface of the vaults uh, from above. Also in this case, uh, it has been uh, necessary to make some operation uh, of simplification and subdivision of the model in order to facilitate its realization with a numerical control milling machine. In this case, uh, we used uh, a BMP uh, FP3 CNC milling machine. For this reason, the vaulted system uh, consisting of 10 different types of arches and vaults uh, was then subdivided into additional portions. The main fabrication constraint uh, was the need to have at least one flat face uh, to place on the work surface and to avoid moving or rotating the machined piece for further operations. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, these uh, operations uh, were um, uh, carried out manually, uh, cutting the solids uh, of the various portions, uh, depending on the thickness of the MDF panel to be used. Sorry for, for interruption. You have two minutes left. Thank yes, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for every piece uh, was sought the best solution to reduce the waste of material and to optimize the times of production. Uh, given the material and the small dimensions of the portions, uh, a, wood with, uh, um, a wood mill with a diameter of uh, three millimeters was used. The tool paths has been, uh, have been prepared and verified by simulation feature of uh, Autodesk Fusion software. For each piece, uh, two different tool paths uh, have been set to the contour for the initial cutting operation uh, along the outermost footprint uh, of the piece and 3D contour for uh, the three-dimensional milling operation that follows the three-dimensional surface. We report, for example, the parameters of the working steps of the three portions of piece number three and the relative times of fabrication. The next step has been the assembly phase currently made up of the simple superimposition of parts. The ultimate goal uh, is uh, to obtain a single block for each of the various portions of the atrium. This will allow to have at the same time in the assembly configuration, a global perception uh, of the surface of the vaulted system from above. And in divided one, a deeper understanding of the geometry of the single vaulted portion. The continuum between real and virtual, realized in this case through physical models, is only one of the devices implemented in the research for transmission of the built heritage. So here's some conclusion. Uh, this step uh, of the research shows uh, the use of digital fabrication to a knowledge workflow applied to built heritage. The physical models realized aim to communicate the complexity of a Baroque vaulted system and explain its uh, geometric nature. Uh, these prototypes could be particularly useful for didactic uh, purposes. However, the mantle mounting uh, uh, can be part of the experience and the entertainment for the final purchaser. Uh, 
The fact that uh, the analyzed space belongs to a museum means that the didactic purpose uh, can, uh, on the one hand, be addressed to the different targets of exhibition visitors, and uh, on the other hand, be specified in tactile experiences for inclusive use. So thank you very much for your attention. We have finished. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so uh, now we have the uh, lunch break, as you all might know, but uh, we thought of making it uh, a chance for a discussion uh, instead. So those, if you uh, would like to discuss with the presenters or ask any questions can stay, uh, unless if you don't, uh, you're, you're uh, of course free to have your lunch break at this hour because we will be back in the afternoon at two o'clock in Rome time. So shall we begin with the discussion? If anybody would like to raise any questions or have any comments, they're welcome to do so. Please uh, turn your camera, your microphone, and you're welcome to do. Uh, I got one question for you all. How should we reconstruct Casa Vecchio Calvizio, or more in general, how should we reconstruct these ancient towns that were damaged by the earthquake in the Abruzzo region? But as for the summer school, we're looking at Casa Vecchio. How should we reconstruct Casa Vecchio Calvizio? Because that is the topic we're looking at for the summer school. So that's a question for the discussion. Let me throw a slogan. I would reconstruct Casa Vecchio Calvizio how it was, where it was, period. And talk about the old buildings, of course. Comera dovera, punto. So would anyone would like to answer this question, <clears throat> this question from the presenters or from the uh, from the audience would like to ask this question, Professor? Question is to everyone because the to everyone in the room. Summer school is about Casa Vecchio Calvizio, which was severely damaged, not very badly, but quite badly because it, uh, by the earthquake. So the point is we need to reconstruct Casa Vecchio Calvizio, both social community but the buildings no buildings no community that's the point so if we don't reconstruct those buildings i'm afraid the people were not going to be able to live in them so that is the point but the thing is how are we going to reconstruct there are many different ways in doing so and i think we should focus the discussion and the summer school on how we reconstruct casa vecchio Calvizio. absolutely so uh would like anyone to to speak about that i I think that, uh, let me start first because people might be hesitating to participate. I think that the first thing to do is to document uh, what's already there before heading towards the design phase, bef before doing anything. Because if we understand the problem, because I think that most of the presenters already have actually outlined the importance of documentation, the importance of, uh, of having images that represent the current context of cities. So um, I think that we should, at the first step, document what, what what's there. We did this then... step, Luai, we did this step last year. So now, I mean, our summer school, we got three groups working for design. So that's the topic. We reconstruct the Pastor Becker Convisio. How to do this? So I think that uh, so if, if documentation is ready, then we can actually come up with the, the design strategies that uh, help to solve the problems. But uh, again, it's it's uh, based on uh, case studies and based on on examples that uh, have been uh, at the same time uh, done in, in in several places. But I would rather make it to other people to actually address these issues. I see that Tom is actually raising his hand. So please join us. 
I, yeah, I, I wasn't really raising it. I was just unmuting myself directly. No, I think that, uh, you know, on the one hand, it's a good question, but it's one of those questions that you can't really ask. You know, asking a question, how do you design something? The answer is a design. It's not an answer. It's not some words. And so I, I think it's a good question, but the question, the, the answer will come with the projects. Yeah, but there should be a discussion about this, you know, within us, because this is what we're doing collectively. So I'm not saying that each one is going to do the same thing. Of course not. Yeah, but it's like if you were to ask Mozart, how would you just, how would you compose the symphony? He would answer you with a symphony, not with an answer, not with yeah. words. Yeah, but this is a conference about reconstructing, no, repopulating, you know. So, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a place for the discussion. Then we're going to have a place for the projects as well. As Anyways, I agree with you that the best starting point is to say, well, let's start with what was there and, you know, in, in with a lack of any other answer, then rebuild as it was where it was. That seems to be the, the most harmless, the safest solution, but maybe not the only one. That's my thought. Anybody else? I would like to make an observation on this because I guess... So hi everyone, thanks for the amazing presentation this morning. Um, I think before I would answer this question with another question, which is who are we rebuilding for? What's the purpose of this? Because we are serving a purpose. So we offer our ability, our capacities, our knowledge, but we need to know what is the final goal of this reconstruction? Who are the final users? Who's the who's going to benefit from it? What's the purpose of it? We are not just rebuilding the physical container of something. It's going to be, ideally, in every post-disaster reconstruction, we are influencing the future development of the community, of that society. So whatever decision we make as a designer, we'll have long-term reverberations on, on the whole context, not just on the physical stability, soundness of structures. So it's a bit of a tricky question. I think there are more questions than answers to this. That is the very point. You know, if you don't reconstruct in the same place, the population will move somewhere else. So that's one point, you know? And one of the strategies of reconstructing somewhere else, if you do so, the population will be somewhere else. So that place will be abandoned. So if you want to change the abandonment process, that's an right strategy. Uh, this is one point, okay? It's place, you know, where you want a population to be. And I would add in the other thing, which is the identity. So when there's an earthquake, there's a very bad problem with the identity for the shock, the trauma, and for the loss of lives, of course. So reconstruction is not only a matter of buildings. It's, it's a matter of people, identity. So I'm not saying that rebuilding the old thing is solving the problem, but building a new one is not solving the problem at all. And we have examples of this, like Belice, Gibellina. Um, I try to answer uh, to Alessandro. <laughs> I am an architect, but I haven't yet practiced architecture. So I'm not a designer. I try. Uh, I know that uh, this kind uh, of uh, little uh, city, this uh, Borghi, uh, are made uh, of uh, spontaneous architecture. And uh, there is a um, um, tradition of, of uh, constructive uh, uh, ways uh, uh, spontaneous, uh, uh, not uh, uh, demanded uh, to expert uh, or uh, artisans, I think. Uh, I think that uh, who uh, have uh, now perhaps uh, adjoined parts and so uh, his, uh, he has house uh, um, became a uh, uh, um, uh, um, structure with uh, uh, a lot of uh, superimposition, I think. Uh, I think that uh, we can uh, uh, give uh, 
some constructive rules, general constructive rules, and work uh, on the traditional constructive techniques. So I think that uh, uh, people who live here, but uh, also some people who want to live in, uh, in uh, this, uh, we want to go in uh, this uh, borghi, uh, could have uh, some rules to work uh, on uh, his house. I think that uh, uh, in this period of pandemic, um, a lot of uh, uh, professionists, a lot of uh, um, people of uh, other nationalities uh, could love to uh, live in uh, this sort of borghi. I know that uh, this uh, is a phenomenon uh, uh, that uh, arises in this period. So, Roberta, sign me, in. sign me in for the professionals who wants to move in. Sign me in for the, 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 you know, the professional who wants to move to the Borgo. I will come. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. So I, I think that uh, it could be a proposal. Now we got another raised hand, Sermin Alp. Yes, I think we, we do have, yes. Hi, uh, yes, I, I just, can you hear me? Okay, no problem. Can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> uh -huh. uh, I just want to exemplify with uh, the city of Bursa again, <laughs> because I did my PhD again in Bursa. Uh, in, in this city, uh, there was a, a two uh, disasters happened in uh, a century. Uh, period, periodically in a century. In 1855, there, is, there was an earthquake, and then in, in 1958, there was a fire, and complete all the area of the historic commercial centers collapsed. So after all, Professor Alessandro Camis, I want to answer your question. After all, uh, according to the clues, according to the uh, reliability of the uh, clues, uh, the whole structure was constructed. Especially, maybe you know it about that. Luigi Piccinato uh, drove the plan of the whole commercial center, and then uh, they found the foundations of the buildings that collapsed, and then he constructed all the home buildings in uh, stone masonry by the by using uh, um, cement uh, and uh, which con uh, very uh, new uh, construction techniques. But uh, when you look at the harm, uh, buildings, you thought that they are historic, but uh, the whole uh, structure is uh, completely with uh, the concrete and the other uh, things like that, or the steel or the uh, the other new materials. So maybe it is better uh, to mention. Maybe uh, I I thought about that. The clues are very important. The functional continuity is very important for the reconstruction, and also the respect to the history is very important because uh, when you respect to the history, uh, it can be acceptable. But uh, when you started to use something not in com uh, not compatible with the traditional texture, it started to be uh, just uh, destruction, not reconstruction. Uh, so it is uh, it is very important point in Turkey case, maybe. Maybe in Europe or the other cities, not very uh, dangerous, but in Turkey case, there are lots of dangerous works under the title of reconstruction instead of uh, restoration. Uh, so uh, this reconstruction term, I think it's very important to understand the clues and the, the uh, uh, documentation uh, stage is very important. The clues are, are very important. The need, the requirement need uh, is very important. I think the reason uh, why we reconstruct them, because here historic commercial sense should be uh, continue. Uh, and should continue their uh, function. Uh, but if there is not anything else, maybe just stay there and just to understand this historical uh, view of the city, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but I think it depends on the case, by the way. Thank you. I don't want to make my comments like that. 
Yes, you're right. It does depend. Oh, Lucia Perez. Uh, you're muted, Lucia. We cannot hear you. No, we cannot hear you. You're muted. You have to turn on your microphone. We cannot hear you. Yeah. Now, I'm having some technical problems here, so I come on and off. Uh, in terms of construction, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank all of the wonderful group of experts uh, that have updated into the global initiative. I would like to thank personally Dr. Alessandro Camis for this wonderful setup. It takes a lot of work uh, to actually uh, make this uh, network possible amongst professionals as well as students. So my question is the following. We have concurrent elements uh, of natural resources uh, that are paving the way to uh, new situations in society like earthquakes, hurricanes, monsoon seasons, and uh, typhoons and uh, all these conditions like the raising uh, level of the seawater. Uh, so when we have concurrent uh, natural disasters, for example, like hurricanes or floods, uh, what kind of initiatives are being done in terms of research for composite materials other than the traditional materials that we have been using today that will somehow mitigate um, uh, the ongoing uh, conditions that are not going to uh, stop anytime sooner and uh, that the solutions that we may have uh, regarding not only structures, I'm sorry, but as you can see, my video uh, is not working. What kind of alternatives to construction are we considering in the immediate future to perhaps mitigate these ongoing beatings of mother nature into our communities? Thank you very much. I was about to answer the, 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 the question before this one, case by case, it's right. So, you know, different buildings have different historical values and so you cannot do the same thing everywhere. Like a Han and a, and a hut, they don't have the same value. But the urban tissue as a whole, the historical urban tissue, in my opinion, as a whole, has a value, especially the public spaces. So if you, you're not, you're not, you're not going to rebuild everything exactly where it was, how it was, but at least the urban structure, the public spaces, the urban tissue should be maintained as much as possible. Buildings with a higher historical value might be reconstructed as they were where they were but the the the, the problem you're outlining lucia is obvious in my title i said almost how it was where it was because if you rebuild an historical building that fell down for an earthquake you want to prevent that building new reconstruction to fall down again in case of another earthquake or hurricane whatever so it's not going to be exactly how it was. It would have some kind of technological improvement to make it more resistant to future events. Probably it's going to have a number of technological updates to include uh, air conditioning, heating, water, you know, you name it. All these new uh, technologies we have in buildings today, which were not there in the Middle Ages when these buildings were built in the first place. But moreover, they might need a typological update, talk about houses, because the house of the 10th century is not like the house of today, it has different needs. So, you know, you're going to have to mediate between the need of preservation as a value and the need of contemporary life. But that's one thing, mediating between, the other one is just avoiding the problem and rebuilding somewhere else, which is 
one of the policies that was deployed in the Aquila earthquake. So that's the reason why I'm so polemic. Massimo Angrilli. Thank you, molto grazie, maestro. Si, uh, thank you, Alessandro. I'm not going to answer your question. Uh, I would like to add some um, elements for the people, for the students to understand the uh, situation in Castelvecchio after the earthquake. Uh, you should remember that the earthquake was the, the first one in 2009, L'Aquila earthquake. So uh, after um, 14 years, no, uh, 13 years, um, there are no um, aggregates that are uh, under construction as far as I know, maybe one, only one. Uh, if I'm wrong, you can, you can, um, you can correct me. And um, many factors contributed to to delay, to stop the reconstruction process. Uh, the first factor is due to the fact that at the beginning, uh, the idea was to uh, uh, reconstruct uh, as a single aggregate, the whole uh, historic center. I'm referring to the egg, okay? The elliptic uh, center. This, because the extraordinary value Of, of this part of the city, um, the, the idea was to, to, to create a, a single project, okay? Unfortunately, this hypothesis uh, was not accepted from citizens and professionals, okay? So this is the first problem. So they started with the idea of constituting several, a multitude of aggregates. Um, I don't know if this is the correct word, aggregati, aggregates. Um, okay. And once this first obstacle was overcome, they've uh, started to face another problem, which was uh, to uh, establish the consortium among the owners of the buildings and the problem of tracing a multitude of owners, even of a single, uh, uh, single uh, canteen, a single winery, um, perhaps inherited from uh, someone in the past, from people that never have, have never been in Castelvecchio. Okay. Uh, and sometimes there are apartments that are uh, owned by several people because they, are, uh, they have inherited those buildings. Uh, and many of, of them are living abroad. They are not, no more in Italy. And sometimes they have no interest in, in uh, coming back in Castelvecchio Cattizio. So um, those problems um, are, are really harsh. And we are in the situation where <clears throat> the 20 aggregates inside the wall, in the, in the egg part of the city, are, are, not, uh, uh, are not yet started. And, and the only aggregate, as far as I know, that uh, are on their, um, on their way to, to be constructed are outside in the new part of the, of the, of the, uh, of the town. Uh, so 13 out of 15 aggregates out of the uh, service center have been already, um, let's say, um, started. So this tells us that the people living in Castelvecchio are more interested in living in the new part of the city, not in the ancient part. And as far as I know, before the earthquake, the uh, historic center was already in inhabited. It was only second homes for people living outside, coming back for, 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 from, for holidays. But this is only a fact we should understand how to face also this problem in order to build, rebuild 
the city center. I can suggest that we, we can imagine also processes leaded by the municipality to become owner of this city center because this is not possible to, we cannot bear the fact that too many people don't have any interest in, in, in this part of the city and they leave it uh, in ruins. So we cannot accept, we should act. And the possibility is to, um, um, I don't know the English for uh, uh, acquisizione coatta, aiuta mi Alessandro. <laughs> exploitation? Is that exploitation in English? No, Con no, 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 no. confiscation. Con yeah, confiscating. Yeah, yeah, it's confiscating. confiscating. Yeah, confiscating. If you don't know, if you do not um, take the maintenance of your building and your, your building became a danger for the community, uh, there are the laws that allows the municipality to become uh, owner of, of it. But of course, it's a lot of money. It requires a lot of money uh, to, to the maintenance, the reconstruction and the maintenance. Yes, I agree with you. It, it, it has to be planned and, and led and sometimes owned by the municipality or other any other subject that could do this because the private are not going to do it. They didn't do it to, to this point. They're not going to do it. But also the very point is the restoration, reconstruction, whatever has to be done by law for an aggregate, not for uh, one building. If the building is attached to other buildings, you cannot restore just one. You have to do it in this yeah, brings together 25, 30, 40 different owners. And it's very difficult to get them all together, having the money and be agreeing on what to do, et cetera, et cetera. So for some yeah, reason, yeah. But maybe even the state could be coming in at some point you know, or the region. Uh, anyhow, somebody above the private owner, I would agree with you on this. Thank you. But that's also the reason why, because why we're thinking of, you know, you know what I'm saying? You know, so the, our Kanija team knows what we're talking about. Okay, so we came up uh, to the end of this session. I would like uh, to say a few remarks. I was greatly honored to share this session uh, with the experts uh, among the best presentations uh, uh, I, I saw. And we also, I mean, the audience and the students, so thank you very much for your time and for your patience and for allowing me to do that too. And I will be handling the microphone to uh, Anna Linick uh, from Politecnico di Bari to handle the afternoon session. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Sorry, I need to stop recording.